before i start uh, let us observe a moment of silence uh, as a mark of respect to the departed soul dr professor c k danasegaran who was a uh, founder member of our association uh, association of oral maxillofacial surgeons of india uh, one of the five members who started this association and who was a pioneer in oral maxillofacial surgery from india a minute of silence thank you thank you dear uh, colleagues uh, he passed away yesterday on the day of international maxillofacial surgeons day uh, we have a senior professor uh, professor uh, prabhu with us to share a few words about his mentor and teacher professor ck danasekaran sir prabhu sir sorry uh, yes we have is uh, got some technical issues i guess okay yeah now now uh, let me invite uh, the principal of uh, dean of vinayakrishnan uh, dental college to share a few words thank you dr jensen how am i audible yes sir you are audible yes yeah distinguished speakers of the day professor paul professor andy professor veerabahu and professor vijay kumar and uh, the office bearers of Tamil Nadu chapter of OMFS and the other delegates who are eager to hear the lecture today a warm welcome to you all i'm really happy on behalf of vinayaka mission shankaracharya dental college to be part of the tamil nadu chapter of oral maxillofacial surgeons at this outset let me congratulate this chapter because amid this pandemic i have heard and seen a lot of lectures that has been happening during this time i think the appreciation has to go to the office bearers especially dr jimson and the other people executive members who are involved in this now having an institution with a specialty is something which is very very a welcoming note for all of us especially the institutions will be benefited much and um, you know we can have a lot of uh, uh, international exchanges and uh, knowledge sharing uh, and as well as the handwork or clinical experiences between ourselves so i am sure that today's lecture with his eminent speakers will be of uh, great importance for all the oral and maxillofacial surgeons who have joined now so i wish you all the best and i thank you for inviting me for this thank you thank you dr baby john for your kind words thank now you. may i invite uh, the dean of tagu uh, dental college and professor chitra chandran to share a few words yes. good morning good morning to uh, to our dear uh, speaker from uk and good evening to a speaker from australia dr paul and good afternoon to all my colleagues in india it's indeed a privilege to be here among the oral surgeons oral surgery is one of the leading branches in dentistry making good big strides and making lot of research and in going forward 
and the association of oral maxillofacial surgery of tamil nadu and pondicherry has been very active during this pandemic period conducting a lot of webinars and also live workshops for the students and for the staff to improve the knowledge and under the head of dr jimson and other bearers office bearers of this association i thank each and every one of you all for organizing these programs for the benefit of the students and the staff yesterday they launched a book also online book it will be very useful for the post graduates and not to say undergraduates as well and general public general uh, dentists this comes free for anybody it's a great effort by the association and congratulate everyone who participated in this effort i'd like to welcome dr andy from uh, uk dr paul from australia who had come specially for this who joined us specially for this program covid has become a, a pandemic period has become a very useful period for all of us to reach out to speakers all around the world in one way is been benefiting us and dr birava who my close friend and my colleague thank you has always been a great help to all of, to, our, to our college dr vijay kumar vice chancellor of yenapoa university thank you sir for being with us and the privilege for tagore dental college to be associated with this with this association of oral maxillofacial surgery and the strikers the group they have been very helpful and very uh, uh, helping all the association activities and i thank them also and i wish all the st uh, students and staffs who are joined for the webinar a good day and i thank the association for involving us and thank dr jimson for involving me in this program thank you one and all thank you ma'am for your kind words uh now uh, let me we have a short uh, release of the newsletter i invite the editor dr kannan to present the newsletter to us yes sir yeah. dr kannan is the editor of our state branch who has been working wonderfully well to and he has put in a lot of efforts to get this uh, newsletter released over to you kannan 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 are you able to share your screen sir he left it seems sir okay no worries i will uh... Okay, and we'll start with the program now. Uh, uh, we have uh, two moderators, Dr. Reena John and uh, Dr. D. Patna Bakmar from Masa University. Uh, Dr. Patna Patna Bakmar is an oral surgeon who did his uh, undergraduate and postgraduate from Ragas Dental College, Chennai. He has been my uh, junior in college and uh, student of Professor Veera Babu. So, and now right now he is uh, working as an associate professor. In the faculty of dentistry masa university malaysia and the other moderator of the moderator of the day dr reena john uh, who does not require any introduction she is the president of our uh, state branch uh, and she is the associate dean of research 
uh, at Vinayak Mission Sankaracharya Dental College, Salem. Uh, and uh, yes, ma'am, I think before we start, we have Dr. Prabhu here. Uh, sir, Prabhu, sir, are you able to hear us? Can you unmute? Sir, Prabhu, sir? Hello. Yes, sir. We can hear you, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. A short tribute. Uh... Hello. Yes, sir. We can hear you, sir. Yes, sir. With the profound grief, by we lost the greatest man of Tamil Nadu in the field of oral and maxillofacial surgery, particularly. To me, it is a great loss that as if I have lost my father because that was PG. That when it when I was doing my post graduation, I lost my father, and he really took care of me as if I am his own son, and he still calls me Sunny. He calls me only Sunny, and you know what sort of moment I will be in. But he is a great man. A philosopher, a guide, godfather to everybody, particularly in the field of oral and maxillofacial surgery. And his death on the maxillofacial surgeon day, International Maxillofacial Surgeon Day, is really apt. Correct. Every one of us, it is death is a life cycle. Anyway, it has happened on a great day for that great man and the great soul. I think I do not want to take much of your time in this webinar. And with these words, I think we should all join to do something in the name of Dr. C.K. Dhanasekaran, uh, particularly an endowment to support a postgraduate. I think I will uh, take the early steps to that along with Dr. Professor Baig and then get back to you soon on 21st and then I'll give you everything on 21st when we are having a condolence meeting. Thank you. Thank, thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, sir. For those uh, words. Uh, it's a difficult time to be for you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, let's start with the program. Over to you, Dr. Uh, Rina, ma'am. Yes, uh, Kannan? Yes, sir. Was I audible or not, sir? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, sir. Thank you, sir. I'm leaving, sir. <laughs> yes, ma'am, you can, you can start the presentation. Thank you, Dr. Jameson. Uh, so I understand that Dr. Kannan is not uh, presenting the newsletter, or has he finished that? Some technical issues. So after the program, at the end of the program, we'll uh, try to... Okay. We don't want to delay the program for that. Yes. So thank you, Dr. Jimson. It is indeed a privilege to uh, uh, introduce the two eminent uh, panelists of today, who I have been given the honors of, uh, uh, of introducing. So the first panelist that I'm supposed to introduce is uh, Professor Dr. Paul Sambrook, who has graduated from uh, in the year 1985 and then went on to postgraduate in the year 1990, along with his fellowship from the Royal Austral Australasian College of Dental Surgeons in 1990. He went on to get his uh, medical degree in 1993. He has been the director of oral and maxillofacial surgery unit in the Royal Adelaide Hospital, University of Adelaide, and uh, the visiting consultant to a number of major public hospitals and a busy specialist practice. He has got a busy specialist practice. He's been the president. He is the president of the Royal Australasian College of Dental Surgeons. He is the president of the International Board for, certif for the Certification of Specialists in OMFS. He's the past president of Australia, Australian and New Zealand Association of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgeons. He's an easy member of the International Association of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgeons. He's a speaker both at the national and international forum. Professor Dr. Sambrook, you are more dear to us. All this and more, I'm sure, is part of your CV, but uh, you are more dear to us and you've become a uh, part of us 
because of your constant support and presence in all of our webinars, always there, giving us a few words of encouragement. That means a, a lot to us. And uh, it is indeed not only my privilege, but um, I'm really uh, honored to be uh, introducing you today. I do not know whether I've ju done justice, but uh, uh, I've tried my best to uh, say whatever I've got from the short CV that Dr. Jimson has uh, shared with me. Professor Dr. Paul Sambrook, welcome to this webinar. Dr. Rina, ma'am, thank you very much. It's uh, most humbling. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. So the next uh, panelists that I have to, I have the honor of introducing to all of you is Professor Dr. M. Vijay Kumar. It's with all that I am uh, introducing this person because he is, uh, uh, he's a giant, uh, uh, a huge person by himself. He's a vice chancellor of Yenapoya, deemed to be university, professor of surgical oncology, Yenapoya Medical College, Mangalore. He graduated way back in 1979, and he went on to do his DNB in general surgery in 1985, went on to do his MCH gen, um, surgical oncology in 1993, and uh, uh, he just did not stop. He went on to do his fellowship into, uh, in the, from the Royal College of Surgeons, Glasgow, in 2007. Uh, he took over, or he started work in the Gidvai Memorial Institute of Oncology from 1984 and continued till 2015 and took a voluntary retirement as the head of the department, took a voluntary retirement as the head of the department. And uh, he was also the director for five years of the same institute, Gidvai Memorial Institute of Oncology. And he didn't sit there quietly as a director, but he elevated the institute from a regional center to a state center institute uh, recognized by the government of India. He's, be, he's, he's got a long, uh, I think even the brief CV that Dr. Jimson gave me is so long. And if I go on, I think we'll, I'll encroach on the time for the webinar. He's been the honorary secretary of the Indian Association of Surgical Oncology in the past uh, and the president in uh, 2015. Uh, he's a vice president of Osteomaths India, and he's been a national and international speaker with many uh, presentations and publications to his credit. Uh, he's been an orator at uh, the state and national level. He's been awarded many awards and, uh, you know, nothing stops him. Uh, I was surprised to see that in his CV that he is trained in robotic surgery recently uh, and uh, he has established it also in the Yenapoya Medical College. That is a glimpse of who Professor Dr. Vijay Kumar is, all for you. The two panelists who are going to speak to you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jimson. Yes, sir. Thank you, Thank you Professor Reena. Now I take privilege to introduce our professors, the next uh, two uh, panelists. Uh, first, it gives me more pleasure and happy to introduce my teacher, Professor M. Veerabhagu. Professor Dr. M. Veerabhagu completed his BDS from Government Dental College, Chennai, and completed his Master's in Oral and Maxillofacial Surgery from Government Dental College, Trivandrum, Kerala. He had his extensive training in cleft lip and palate surgery from under the able guidance of late Professor uh, Aidan Wala. He joined Progress Dental College in 1993 and started his academic uh, teaching career. And from then, from then onwards, he started inspiring many junior lecturers, junior, te junior uh, trainees, and uh, so many students, including me. He has held various positions in AOMSI, that is Association of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgeons of India. Uh, he was the chairman of uh, Indian Board of uh, Oral and Maxillofacial Surgery. And now, currently, he is the president of the association. Under his able guidance, the association is achieving greater heights. I wish you all the best, sir. And Thank then you. he has published numerous articles and research papers in various international journals. I take privilege in introducing Professor Virabhagu to the international uh, faculty, to, to, to the international uh, 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 webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Vatuna uh, Kumar. Such a wonderful, nice word, kind Thank words. You. Thank you. <laughs> Always your blessings. Thank you, sir. Now, it, now, again, it gives me a great pleasure and privilege to introduce our professor, Andy Edwards. Mr. Henry, Andy Edwards, born in Dundee, Scotland. He completed his basic degree in dentistry in 1987. 
a period of junior uh, positions in oral and maxillofacial surgery, followed then by gaining FDS from the Royal College of Surgeons and Physicians of Glasgow in 1993. He went to medical school, qualifying MBBS, his MBBS from the University of Aberdeen in 1998. His basic surgical training was in the best of Scotland, admitted as FRCS in general uh, surgery of the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Glasgow in 2001. He went on to his higher surgical training in OMFS in the northwest of England, gaining the intercollege fellowship in OMFS in 2006. He spends a period of period working in South Africa as a visiting register at the University of Pretoria, gaining valuable experience in facial trauma. He is currently the consultant oral and maxillofacial surgeon at the Royal Preston Hospital, specializing in the surgical correction of facial deformity and facial trauma. He has delivered numerous talks nationally and internationally on education and on various topics on his own clinic. He has his own clinical practice within the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Glasgow. He is currently the Dean of the Faculty of Dental Surgery and Vice President of the College. Sir, Professor Handy, we take privilege in, in welcoming you for this webinar. Thank you very Welcome. much indeed for these kind words. Welcome, sir. Especially for spending your uh, morning, early morning Sunday for us. Thank you so much. So yeah. now we will we'll start with the first webinar by Professor Handy Edwards. The topic is golden hour, golden hour in maxillofacial trauma. Sir, Professor, that the screen is yours. Excellent. Good morning to you all. Could you hear me and see my screen, hopefully? Everybody's saying no, yeah. which is always a good sign. Yeah, excellent. Marvellous. Yes, well, uh, very, very good morning to everybody uh, and a very good afternoon and a very good evening. Uh, it's very, very uh, privilege for me to be here again speaking to you all. Um, many thanks to the two co-chairs for their very kind words. Um, i just as well like to pass on some condolences from the maxillofacial surgeons in the UK. Uh, you heard some very kind words about CK Dan Sakram and uh, I didn't know the man, but I believe he was held in very high esteem in India. And I'd just like to pass on our condolences from the OMFS uh, uh, colleagues in the UK as well. I'd like to thank uh, President uh, Birabuan for inviting me and in Wells Jimson as well for, for getting me up early again on a Sunday morning, which is always, always fantastic. Many thanks to the two deans uh, again for their invite as well. And it's great to see that uh, you had a fantastic day yesterday launching your first OMFS book. Um, and I was able uh, to take part in it as well. So thank you very much indeed for giving me the uh, uh, honor to speak to you today. The topic I'm going to speak to you about is the golden hour in maxillofacial trauma. Um, and you're going to think, well, how, how does a golden hour affect maxillofacial trauma? Well, it does. Um, I'm going to get a little bit of an overview of it, um, how it affects maxillofacial trauma. And also as well, I'd just like to give you a flavour of how we deal with major trauma in the UK, the establishment of major trauma centres, and telling a little bit about what we call mass casualty events, which unfortunately in this day and age are becoming um, all too familiar to us throughout the globe, basically. So trauma has been around for a long, long time. It's a huge problem, both financially, uh, holistically, uh, physically, mentally as well. But you can see just some of the numbers there. Six million dying per year globally from injuries. 16,000 people per day worldwide as well. But the permanent sequelae is huge. Trauma actually kills more people than HIV, TB and malaria combined, which is, which is you know, surprising in this day and age as well. Um, in the UK and in more of the developed countries, our leading cause of, of, of facial trauma, as we all probably know, are um, motor vehicle accidents, uh, probably pedestrian collision stumblings and stuff like that as well. Um, but as I say, the leading cause in underdeveloped areas is the road traffic accidents followed by assaults as well. So we are seeing a slight change in the pattern of where the way trauma is and the way trauma happens, basically, particularly with maxillofacial trauma. 
So what is this golden hour? What, what, what are we talking about when we talk about the golden hour? Well, this phrase was coined, oh, way back in the sort of 60s, really, by this chap, um, Dr. Adams Cowley. He was a trauma surgeon, an orthopedic trauma surgeon. And he developed this in America. And he's known as the father of trauma medicine. He established the uh, shock trauma unit at uh, the University of Maryland in Baltimore. And that was established way back in 1958. So he's seen a need that there was uh, for trauma and the appropriate management, and in particular in pre-hospital uh, management and assessment of trauma. Uh, he was the one that first used helicopters for uh, evacuation of civilians, and they're not talking about military here, this is for civilians back in the late 60s. And he used the um, First Nation statewide EMS, which is a medically, uh, emergency medical uh, services in the way back in the early 70s. So he coined the phrase, the golden hour is between the hour between life and death. If you're critical injured, you've less than 60 minutes to survive. You might not die right then, but there may be three days to maybe two weeks later. But if something has happened to your body that's irreparable. And basically, they sort of summed up there that the first hour after injury will really determine your outcome, really, and your chances for survival at a later date. So that's essentially what this golden hour is basically. Now, we are in the world of uh, epidemiology and we know trauma deaths is a sort of trimodal um, distribution of trauma deaths. You can see there 50% of deaths are within what we call immediately. 30% happen within hours and 20% happen further down the line in days and weeks. And this golden hour is dealing with that first 80%, the immediate and the 30% in the hours after, after impact. However, what can we do about the media? Well, not a lot, really, because these are catastrophic injuries, really. These are, you know, something like a decapitation, a significant blast injury, for example, whereby you've got significant catastrophic hemorrhage, you've got significant uh, neurological injury or, that, or spinal cord or a suffocation. So these are immediate injuries, which you know, we can't do anything about. They happen instantaneously, for example. The ones we're looking at are the early ones. They happen within hours of the energy. And they're roughly about 30% of these deaths. And most of them are about 50% of them. Probably more now are caused by hemorrhage and the other half really by what they would call uh, a neurological insult. Um, and these ones are the ones that they're targeting when we talk about the golden hour. The late peaks of the other 20%, and that's the ones that tend to succumb to things like sepsis or, or, or multiple organ failure, and that's further down the line. We live in evidence-based um, medicine and evidence-based surgery, evidence-based maxillofacial surgery, and we can see there that uh, there is evidence, this chap Sampolis um, quoted quite a few papers that uh, looking at pre-hospital time, uh, and if it was over 60 minutes, you had a significant increase of dying, basically, your mortality rate was significant. And again, the, you're looking at the pre-hospital time again, if you reduce that, your risks of dying were reduced. They were actually quite crude, these figures, when they done it. They were looking at the severity of the injury and the age of the population. A couple other studies were done, 2002 and 2005, and again, looking at the response time. Uh, and again, they looked at the survival rate when they uh, looked at response time, and you got the response time into five or four minutes. However, it's all not clear cut like that. We're all not saying the golden hour is a fantastic thing. There's a lot of evidence against it, basically, of what they call inconclusive evidence. There's a lot of studies. The main one's the one at the bottom of your screen. This was quite a significant study because it looked at 51 trauma centers throughout the, the part of the USA or North America. And they actually established no relationship between the interval time for the emergency medical service response and the actually mortality amongst the injured patients. And this is we're talking about physiological abnormalities. We're talking about things like hemorrhage, for example, basically. So there is evidence against it as well. So, you know, the jury's a little bit out on, on, on the golden hour and, 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 and does it have any sort of um, relevance? I, I'm, I believe it does. Um, I'm going to introduce you to another concept as well here that you may well have heard of. Now, way back in the mid 70s, this was Dr. James K. Steiner. He was an orthopedic surgeon and he was a pilot as well. And he was ferrying his uh, children back, four children and his wife and his, his aeroplane in, in Nebraska and it crashed. Um, his wife, unfortunately, was killed immediately as she was within that 50 percent we talked about and uh, the immediate injury. Um, however, um, he, him and his four children had significant injuries. He himself had a, a rib injury, had actually a fractured zygoma. One of his children had a, a rib injuries and fractured limbs. 
they actually spent eight hours awaiting uh, um, somebody to come and get to them um, because the mist was so, so far they couldn't actually see the road. But eventually when he did see the road, they got to a local hospital about eight hours later. The local hospital was closed. It was actually closed. So they actually had to go and wake up the two GPs who manned the hospital uh, and the nurse. Um, but the care was not inadequate. They just didn't know what they're doing. They actually had to phone a colleague at Lincoln General Hospital and eventually evac uh, medevaced him out to Lincoln General Hospital, where they actually got a reasonable standard of care. He survived, as did his four children. So he developed ATLS, and some of you are probably familiar with this, the Advanced Trauma Life Support. Um, I've gone through it. I'm a, an instructor on it. I have been for a number of years. But that was so, the first course was way back uh, in the late 70s. Uh, and the American ecology surgeon sort of dropped the ATLS protocol in the 80s. And it's actually gone through worldwide as well. And some of you may well be on an ATLS course. You may well be instructors. Uh, and I, if you haven't, I would certainly commend you to do one. What does it mean? Well, the sort of broken down into little bits. And Max Fax, a role of facial surgery, does dovetail into some of these there. Preparation and triage, that's the sort of pre-hospital event, primary survey, resuscitation, adjuncts to primary surgery with further resuscitation, secondary survey, which we get involved in a lot, adjuncts to secondary survey, and then we call post-resuscitation monitoring and what we call definitive care. Um, Max Fax gets involved in all aspects of that. And, and depending on where you are and which part of the world and you know the services that are available, you may well be involved at a very early stage in the primary survey and involved with resuscitation. So what is ATLS? Well, this is a primary survey, and you're all familiar with this mnemonic, the airway with C-spine um, inline immobilization or protection, breathing with ventilatory support, not just breathing, you have to ventilate somebody. There's no point in giving them an airway if you can't ventilate. Uh, circulation, uh, again, you've got to establish your circulation, but you've got to control the hemorrhage. You've got to turn off the tap. Uh, there's no point in you pouring fluids in or blood in if the tap's still open. Again, disability, we're looking at the neurological, the, the neurological injuries, uh, um, uh, from a neurosurgical viewpoint, and exposure and environmental control is looking at the body in a whole, basically. So this ATLS protocol. So what are we talking about? Well, obviously the first one is airway, airway and maxillofacial trauma. How does this impact on us in this sort of first immediate area, basically, this sort of time that we're, we're dealing with? Well, we all know that if somebody has significant panfacial fractures, the way the inclination of the skull base is, that maxilla can be forced back the way, it can block the nasopharyngeal airway. And also we know that if there's an anterior fracture of the mandible because of the attachment of the genial muscles, the tongue can actually fall back uh, from its anterior insertion and actually occlude the airway, basically, particularly if the patient's supine. And you often see that when a patient is brought into the um, there, they're often blocked with head blocks in, they're often on a spinal board, and they're lying flat, aren't they? They're always lying flat. Um, and that's where the significant risk to the airway is there. And you can see there, there's a significant panfacial fracture, um, which has forced the uh, maxilla back the way. And again, you can see there's a midline fracture of the mandible with detachment of the genial muscles. And again, the tongue will back there. So you're getting a double whammy here. You're getting the maxilla thrown back the way and you're getting the mandible uh, with the tongue falling back the way. So the simplest thing to do is sit the patient upright, yeah and pull on that maxilla, yeah? Pull the maxilla and pull it forward and that will disimpact it and create an airway for you. So it's a very simple maneuver that you can do. And obviously um, a lot of our first responders in our, in our trauma team are very aware, very aware of this maneuver there. And you'll be surprised doing a simple maneuver that will actually create an airway and you'll find the patient um, isn't hypoxic anymore. Obviously teeth, um, particularly if there's been a ballistic type injury, um, bone fragments as well, they, they, you know, if they're, if they're not in the mouth, um, where are they? Are they in the airway? No. Are they in the, in the lips? No. Are they in the, in the floor where they've uh, had their injury? So again, always be mindful of their may well debris, um, which may well be blocking the aerodigestive tract as well. Hemorrhage, I'll come, I'll talk a little bit about hemorrhage um, from the open wounds and nasal bleeding. Um, again, that can compromise the airway. Soft tissue, there's massive soft tissue swelling, which happens quite quickly. And you've seen that when patients turn up to um, the trauma unit that um, causes significant airway compromise, particularly if they've got subsequent laryngeal or pharyngeal uh, injuries to the epiglottis. And that causes significant problems with uh, airway obstruction. A simple algorithm here is, 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 is to, to, to follow this really. And our anaesthetists will follow this. This is something that... Uh, Obviously, they're very mindful of, but certainly if there is 
couple of things are spontaneously breathing, yes. Um, if it's normal, you just reassess. But obviously, uh, if you anticipate any airway obstruction, nasal tracheal or oral tracheal. Now, nasal tracheal might be difficult, but they've got panfacial tractor fractures um, and the anatomy is distorted. So you may well have to think about oral tracheal. Um, they talk about uh, pharmacological adjuncts as well. We talk about what they call an RSI, a rapid sequence induction. If they're not breathing um, and unable to intubate, there are various devices available. LMA is okay, but unfortunately it will not protect the airway. Combi tubes to try and retry it. And then ultimately, if we fail there, we've got to, to go to a definitive surgical airway, which as we all know is, is, is a tracheostomy or indeed potentially a submental intubation as well. That's something we think about. So there's some indications for a definitive airway thingy, absent spontaneous breathing. Obviously the patient with a Glasgow coma scale less than nine, that means they're comatose. They're unable to protect their own airway. And I'll talk a little bit about coma scale in a minute. If they're desaturating and their saturation is persistently no 90%, high risk for aspiration, i.e. either bleeding quite extensively for the facial region. And certainly if they've gone into systemic shock, i.e. the um, blood pressure, the systolic blood pressure is, 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 is below 80, that indicates significant catastrophic hemorrhage. And then there's the old adage, cannot ventilate, cannot intubate situations, which means they're looking at uh, securing the airway in uh, what they call a, a surgical airway. Now, there's only two types that we know of. One's a cricothyroidotomy and one's a tracheostomy. Tracheostomy in my books is an elective procedure, although I have done a few in an emergency situation. It's not to be um, advocated at all. Um, two types of cricothyroidotomy we know is the needle one and the surgical scalpel one. I would go for the surgical scalpel one if we were going to go to that as well. How about hemorrhage in this sort of first period, this golden hour? Well, we know maxillofacial injuries can pro prone to massive hemorrhaging, and it can vary from anything 1% to 11%. And what do we mean by life-threatening hemorrhage? Well, it's a loss of three units of blood in about two hours, and the hematocrit drops to a level less than 21%. So there are different classes there, class one, class two, class three, and class four. Class four hemorrhage is when you start having significant derangement of the physiological parameters. And we're talking about more than 50%, 40% blood loss here. You've got significant impact on the heart rate, which goes up. The blood pressure starts to go down, particularly the systolic. You then become tachypneic with an increased respiratory rate, often 20 to 30. Um, reduced urine output, they often become anuretic as well. Uh, they become obtunded because the Glasgow coma scales come down. And when you're looking at their biochemistry, their base excess, they become significantly acidotic then. And then obviously you have to indicate a major blood transfusion protocol. Now it's unusual to get a class four hemorrhage from the head and neck region. Usually you're thinking that there's probably something in the way of an intra-abdominal bleed or indeed what we call a compartment bleed where a lower limb has fractured um, and there's closed or unseen or what they call occult hemorrhage. In the maxillofacial region, we know our anatomy. Most of the bleeding tends to come from the maxillary artery, um, which all its branches there, which supplies the mid face, basically. It's unusual to get bleeding from the lower part of the, 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 the facial region because it's really the facial artery that, that, that um, tends to cause that. So it tends to be the mid face tends to bleed, tends to be the maxillary artery and its subsequent branches, which supply the nasal region, the nasoethmoidal region. And that's where most of the bleeding tends to come. Even then, you can see in this come this catastrophic um, injury here, but there's not a lot of bleeding. You know, it tends the bleeding tends to sort of self seal itself as well. You can see we've established an airway, but there's limited bleeding, and you often get that with significant facial fractures. That bleeding doesn't tend to be an issue. If it is, however, then how do we control it? Well, pressure packing—that's good old-fashioned way. Reduce the fractures, you know, stick a bite block in there. And that often puts pressure on a vessels that are, are that you can't see deep at the back of the maxilla. A balloon tamponade, and I'll give you a couple of examples of how we deal with balloon tamponading. Um, we're, we're privileged here in the unit I work with to work with um, interventional radiologists who are excellent using angiography. So we can use transarterial embolization um, and they're very good. And that's particularly reasonably to use. It's difficult with significant catastrophic mid-face injuries, but if you've got somebody like a knife injury or a, a, a significant neck injury with penetrating trauma that's quite specific, then angiography is very, very good at dealing with that. In severe cases, you can go to, 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 to to tie off the external carotid. I've only done that twice in my career. Um, uh, and it's not a thing to be done 
significantly likely and its, it's, its success rate is not great to be quite honestly because of the significant uh, collateral blood supply from the internal carotid. So um, it's uh, there. How about the nose? This is where most of the bleeding comes from. It's either from the front or from the back. Um, and you can see there the anterior is, is actually a lot easier to manage because you can see it and you get into it. Um, this is little area which our ENT colleagues talk about. Most of it comes from there. Um, the posterior is a lot more difficult to deal with. And this is when blood can go back the way. So often you don't see this blood. So it occultly goes down and the patients end up swallowing a significant amount of it, basically. So the first time you're aware of it is when they vomit uh, a significant amount of blood because it's been going back the way rather than through the, the anterior nasi. So packing, well, very easy. There's lots of these packs available, these rhino packs, basically. And they, 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 they basically put them along the floor of the nose. You inflate it with fluid. Some of them self-inflate. Some of them you've got to add fluid. Some of them just will float. So there's various packs there. And you obviously have a string because you, you want to be able to take them out. You want to be fishing for them, basically. So that's pretty straightforward for the posterior bit, which is a more difficult one, Foley catheter is quite good as well to go that. So you can place that along the floor of the nose and inflate it and pull it back into the posterior nasal space. These nasal balloons are very good. There's again, rhino packs, there's various models around and stuff like that. But essentially there's two compartments to them, an anterior, a big anterior compartment, which fills the anterior nasies and a smaller um, posterior pack as well, which can help occlude the posterior nasal pack. So these packs are very effective for um, for nasal hemorrhage, which most of the bleeding will come from when you've uh, got significant facial injuries. Um, th these are, as I said, the angiograph with selective embolization. It's just shown you a map of the external carotid and its various uh, branches, but they're very good for um, what we call penetrating neck injury. If you've got somebody with a stab injury to one of the levels in the neck, for example, or the facial region. Uh, and again, when you've got failed nasal packing, you've got, you put all your packs in and it's still bleeding your packs and it's bleeding behind your packs. It's very good to get your interventional radiologist to come along and give you a hand to try and selectively embolize uh, one of the vessels. And the ones we've got in the unit here are fantastic. Um, but about brain injury now, obviously, if they've got a significant maxillofacial injury in this, this golden hour, they're going to talk about significant brain injury. There are either two types, what they call a vocal brain injury, and you can see there in the middle is obviously in the one on the right, there's significant uh, trauma cause a skull fracture. That's pretty obvious. Or the other one is sometimes what they call a diffuse brain injury or uh, diffuse axonal injury, where they get this acceleration, deceleration injury, and they, they get this smart swelling of their brain, basically. So brain injury, you're all familiar with the Glasgow Coma Scale, being um, a, a vice president and dean of the faculty in the Royal College of Surgeons in Glasgow. I'm quite proud of it. It was um, coined by uh, Graham Teasdale, now Professor Sir Graham Teasdale. He was actually president of my college from 2003 and 2006. That's a picture of him there, and that's the... Um, portrait that hangs in the college uh, of Sir Graham. And you're all aware of the Glasgow Coma Scale and, and how to use it basically. Uh, lowest point is three, not zero, as a lot of people think. Uh, and 15 is the top one. Anything um, below nine is what we call coma. And then it's divided into three to 15 for minor brain, moderate nine to 12, and severe brain is less than nine, which is comatose. So it's a very, very good scale. It's been used worldwide. Um, there are modifications of it available, but that's the original coma scale as uh, it was coined in 1974. What are the signs? Well, we all know the signs uh, when you examine a patient, the battle sign and the, uh, uh, the rhinorrhea. Look for the, you can see the classic picture here of this sort of straw colored fluid dribbling down the nose, basically. And again, the raccoon faces or panda eyes. There's a good chance that there's a, there's a skull base injury here. Spinal cord. Now, we, we tend to forget a lot about these because spinal cord injury, if you've had a significant maxillofacial injury and your patient presents in this golden hour or this first presentation, you're going to be aware of the fact that the C-spine might have a, a be injured. Now, that's difficult for us because as surgeons, we like to move the head. And of course, you can't move the head. It's a disaster because then you've got to move it to actually reposition patients, move them off table. So it has implications, basically. And most of the fractures that occur of the C-spine are because of the direct injury to the, to the facial region uh, and also the cervical spine and actually the ligaments that attach it. Uh, most of the injuries can either cover high up or low down. So it's either C1, C2, which they call the hangman's fracture, which is catastrophic. C6 and C7, um, there's a higher chance of survival um, 
albeit with a uh, paraplegia um, with disc herniation as well. So that's just a couple of studies that were done showing that the, the association with spinal injuries is mainly with a mixed pattern really um, uh, with maxillary and mandibular, because that obviously goes hand in hand with the amount of force there. You're going to break more bones if it's bigger force. Bigger force is a good chance you've got a C-spine injury. And again, as I said before, most of the injuries come either at C1, C2, or you can see there at C5 and C6. Um, this, this study, this study where Pete Revington and the team came out uh, way back in uh, 2015, and they actually looked at the, actually the, the, the amount of C-spine injury, CSI associate, was actually quite low, uh, 2.2%. Uh, and they looked at all the studies that showed it. So there was from zero up to 8%, which is relatively low. But I, I was reminded of this um, on Friday. Um, this was a patient who uh, was part of the mountain rescue team here in the northwest of England. Um, I won't tell you the circumstances, but we're meant to have a lockdown here in the UK and there was an idiot went out, decided to go on the hills uh, for whatever reason. Um, and he got lost and they had to send the mountain rescue people out. This is a mountain rescue uh, 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 gentleman who was part of the team uh, and he fell 200 feet down a mountain, survived. But you can see there he's got a significant uh, pan facial fracture, four, two, three, call it whatever you want. However, um, the reason we couldn't go in to fix his face straight away was that. So you can see there significant C6, C7 severe distraction and transection of the cord basically. So this gentleman unfortunately um, is uh, paraplegic now um, because of the injury at C6, C7. So just be very, very mindful of that when you do go in to examine the patients of a C-spine injury. I mean, obviously the mechanism of injury here, a fall off a mountain is going to cause significant amount of injury. Um, not just in the facial region, he suffered multiple other injuries as well. Um, but he, we fixed him on Friday um, after his C spine fracture had been treated. He had that treated as well, but we, we managed to treat his facial fractures on Friday. A um, couple of cases. This, you know, I mean, what have we done here? Well, we've secured an airway. It's massive what you think tissue loss. Um, but again, We've controlled the hemorrhage. Now, a couple of nasopharyngeal airways are very, very good as well to pop them in, and they just help placing things like, uh, for example, packing or Foley's catheters. Um, so they're very, very good, but you can see the amount of swelling it's gone in here. Um, also as well, anaesthetists are great at putting tubes down, but they often put the tubes down and they take with them a tooth. Now you can see here as well, um, a tooth ended up in the lung basically. So always mindful of when the anaesthetist puts his tube in his very, very happy that the tube goes in because he's got an airway. But then you say, well, where's this incisor tooth? It was here and it's been forced into the lung. So just be quite mindful of the fact of where teeth are uh, and a CT scan of thorax will show you a simple chest film. Again, look at this gap. This is a guy that came to me. Uh, significant, you can see scan here, significant pan facial fracture. This is his maxilla uh, and it's completely off-ended. Um, it's hanging on by a thing, pedicle here. Uh, his mid face is just catastrophically injured and there's a hole in his face here and you're thinking, well, what caused this? It was a fence post. Um, this guy was driving his car on drugs and alcohol uh, in the middle of the night, went through a field and a fence post went in his face here. So you can see here the fence post going in and it's coming out here as well. Um, we secured an initial oral tube, an oral tracheal tube, but we had obviously to do a surgical airway. But there was very little in the way of facial bleeding. So we, we thought, well, we'll do an angiogram here because I was a bit worried taking this out, what would happen um, when we got them into the OR. So we took them, we took it out um, and that's a plank of wood that came out there, which was embedded in his mid face. And, and there was actually very little bleeding, believe it or not. So again, just to tell you that, okay, the, 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 you know, it's a catastrophic injury, but there's not a significant amount of hemorrhage there at all. And this is a very, very localized injury and absolutely no other injuries at all from that. Um, so just to be aware that uh, even though it looks quite significant, then the, um, the, uh, the bleeding is minimal there. So I'm quickly just going to go through a little bit of trauma management in the UK, how we manage our trauma services. Um, we looked at it in 2012 and we reorganized everything into what we call major trauma centers or MTCs. Uh, the 27 of them um, in England we're talking about. I'm not talking about Scotland at the moment. I'm just talking about England. We've got 11 which are mixed for adults and children, 10 for adults only, five for kids, and we've got a collaborative centre as well, one collaborative centre. Um, 
what what is the what is a major trauma centre? Well, we should be having about two hundred and fifty critically injured patients, and that's due to the ISS or injury severity score. And I would talk to you and confuse you about that. But usually, to three to four million population, it provides twenty four hour day uh, consultant led resuscitative trauma team. Um, they have all the surgical specialties on one site orthopedic, general vascular, neuroplastic, cardiothoracic, us, which is part of head and neck, urology, interventional radiology, and anesthesia with appropriate care facilities. Quick map of England, that's just to show you where they're based. The ones in blue are the adult and children, the ones in green are the adult ones, and the ones in red are the children only one. You can see where I am in the northwest of England, my hospital is number 18. Um, we're in a high density population here in the northwest of England. That's why there's a number of adult and children ones in this radius here, because you've got cities like Manchester uh, and Liverpool here, which has got a, a significant population in the northwest. So these are the major trauma centres. What happens in a major trauma centre? Busy slide. Um, essentially, step one is to assess their vital levels assess the anatomy, assess the mechanism injury. Remember I told you this guy fell 200 feet off a mountain. That's a significant injury. He's going to get whisked straight to a major trauma centre because there's a chance it's there. Whereas somebody, you know, stumbles out the front door and falls, it's highly unlikely they're going to be taken to a major trauma centre. And again, if there's any special ones. So basically you're looking at coma scales less than 14, low systolic blood pressure less than 90, uh, tachy a tachypneic uh, or anything, and that's pediatric ones, which is a different one. The anatomy, if there's any chest, amputation, penetrating injury, open fracture, spinal trauma, et cetera, et cetera. So they are assessed all at the time. The mechanism, I talked to you about traumatic death in the same passenger compartment, i.e. you're in a car and somebody next to is dead, falls greater than 220 feet, well, obviously fallen off a mountain, trapped under a vehicle, um, bullseye window or damage to the post of the vehicle, and that's basically if somebody's hit the, hit the, hit the uh, windscreen. Uh, the pedestrian is that thrown over the vehicle, i.e. they went right over it, or they've been ejected from the vehicle at speed, i.e. this guy had the fence post, he was ejected from the vehicle at speed, uh, being unrestrained. And these are some special circumstances. So all these basically are vital signs, an anatomy mechanism, and there's yes, 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 yes to that. They go to an MTC, which is a major trauma centre. So they may well bypass the nearest hospital uh, and go straight to a major trauma centre, um, given the mechanism of injury. How are we supported? Um, well, there's my unit right in the middle of here. We have helicopter, what they call the helicopter emergency ambulance services, 16 of them covering the whole of the UK. Um, response time, 17 minutes to anywhere in the UK and a transfer time of 10 minutes. Um, where I have, there are three helicopters based at Blackpool and Barton. Barton's another airfield not far from where we are. And they cover the northwest, basically, which is our hospital, along with the hospitals in Manchester and Liverpool. Um, they cover three, six, five, seven days a week. They only fly during daylight hours, unfortunately, not during nighttime. They are, have a pilot, a paramedic and a doctor on board, um, so they can provide pre-hospital care, basically. That's a view of my window in my office um, at the Royal Preston Hospital. It's the other day, it flies right over my office, which gets very loud, and that's our uh, landing pad there. So um, is, it, is it beneficial? Well, a lot of studies looked here, and it's expensive running these service. It's about £850,000 plus <laughs> uh, to run the service um, uh, using the ground rather than the ground one there. Uh, it does show that there is a benefit to doing that in the way of uh, amount of patients saved, basically, rather than comparing it with um, road traffic accident. But it's an expensive, expensive mode of delivery of patient to you, but it gets them there quickly. So what about, I'm just going to finish on the last couple of minutes. Apologies for running over. Major incident mass casualty event. You'll probably all be aware of the... Uh, major incident, what we call mass casual events. In this day and age, most of it is, is terrorist related, uh, you know, in India, um, cognizance of the uh, Mumbai incident you had. Um, uh, in the UK, I don't know if you remember this, this was in 2017. This happened in the northwest of England, where I am. And this was um, an Ariana Grande conference, conf concert, which was held in Manchester at the Manchester Arena. Abdul Halehi, he uh, detonated a shrapnel bomb, which was uh, committed, obviously, suicide. And the 19 people actually died immediately, but the total was 23 died. 
There was 112 people were hospitalised for injuries throughout the northwest of England. Uh, 27 were actually treated, actually, which didn't require hospitalisation. But the majority, as you see, were children. It was a concert for children. And most of them there were teenagers, basically. And as you can see that picture at the bottom, most of them that died there were teenagers or indeed the parents of the teenagers. So mass casualty and mass events are significant in this day and age and we live with it. In the UK, we have guidelines and uh, 2020, they came out basically. And it's quite a complicated algorithm basically, but um, a lot of it involves around primary triage at the scene and where they go to, which is either a major trauma center, a trauma unit, or any healthcare facility, and then children on the right-hand side have a significant other one, basically. So initially, if it's a mass casualty, uh, major trauma centre, if they can, and then obviously, if the regional capacity has been exceeded, then we can look to transfer it out. And when this happened in the northwest of England, we had to alert our colleagues further afield and other major trauma centres, just in case we became overwhelmed with um, casualties. So this is how it happens when we have mass casualties uh, there. You can see it's a very structured, um, very almost algorithmic, but very definitive protocols we've got for the patients, basically. Uh, we've got trauma anesthetists, we've got rapid transfusers, the RT1 and 2. Um, we've got a recess OPD, we've got two doctors, obviously. You've got the trauma team leader, and then you've got somebody who's just there to scribe. That's somebody just writing things down to see what's going on. And, and that's very, very important. And the trauma team leader coordinates everything there. So it's a very, very focused, very pragmatic way of dealing with major injuries and, and and this will be this will be one trauma room and you'll have another trauma room which will have the very similar setup so it's very very structured in the way the care is delivered from maxillofacial these are taken from the guidelines um, again the guidelines are catastrophic hemorrhage again compression bandage hemostat silk sutures um, again, we can look uh, where to, to the damage uh, the facial artery if it's bleeding from there, about the superficial temporal artery. Um, talk about a loose maxilla. Again, we've talked about that as well. Um, blast injuries affect barrow trauma, which affect the ear as well. So we've got to be mindful of that. Um, again, be mindful of uh, obstructions from missing teeth as well. Head and neck wounds, again, we should explore them in theatre. Um, again, if it's a blast injury, you've got a lot of grit and foreign materials in there, you need to clean it out. Uh, nasal hemorrhage, they talk about rapid rhino packing and posterior nasal packing. So it's very structured how we deal with mass casualties. And, and unfortunately, it's, it's just one of these things in this day and age that maxillofacial surgeons will get involved in. And we, we were involved in some of the casualties that came from the... Uh, the Ariane Grande uh, concert in Manchester, and, and, and they were children, unfortunately, which is um, uh, even more distressing to deal with rather than, it's, it's distressing anyway, um, but I don't. So uh, a significant um, um, wake up call really. Uh, and as I say, it can happen, if it can happen here, in, it can happen anywhere in the world. Uh, just a little bit about some of the injuries. We've got to think about uh, uh, globe perforation about the, the 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 ears about tympanic rupture of its of its thing about CSF we've talked about about the displaced maxilla again we talked about about comminuted mandible teeth are they on the floor in the lip or in the lungs we've talked about that again facial lacerations and stuff like that we talked about penetrating neck injuries into the different zones uh, and whether or not we need to uh, uh, always explore deep to the platysma should always be explored in the theatre you should not be exploring that. Uh, anywhere at all in the ER or indeed in your clinic. Take them to theatre. You never know what you might find. So that's been a sort of tour de force, really, of maxillofacial trauma in the golden hour of where we are. I've touched a little bit on um, some of the injuries that will be pertinent uh, within that first significant period of what we call primary survey. Um, talked a little bit about what major trauma centres are and how we manage trauma in the UK. I know it's done differently throughout the, U throughout the world. And a little bit about mass casualties and how we deal with that um, again in the UK, given that we do live in these, um, uh, these times, unfortunately. So again, just to say thank you very much to everybody. Um, obviously, delighted to take questions at the end or whenever. So back to you, Jimson. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. For a, thank you, Prof, for a well-enriching and informative lecture. 
uh, in fact, uh, we are very happy that still we are following the GCS. Thank you for giving us that one. And there are a few questions from our participants. Uh, this is uh, Srigant Vanjari. How to secure cervical spine if cervical collar is not available while transporting the patient to trauma center? A simple way you can do it, there's no C-spine collar, it's just to use blocks, block, block the, what they call block the neck. Now you can block the neck with anything there basically. You can roll up um, uh, basically um, cloth or you can roll up some trousers, block them at the side of the neck and tape over the top of the neck, uh, the head. So you can block off the neck there, anything to support the side of the head and put some tape over it basically. So you don't need to have a, a C-spine um, collar. Um, Bizarrely enough, my car in the boot, I have three C-spine collars. Um, I just, you know, I carry them around with me all the time, basically, uh, and one pediatric one as well. So there are ways that you can secure the C-spine, basically. But any time that you see a patient that you should be doing is keep hold of the neck and hold the neck and mobilize the neck if you're a first responder and you're on site and you can use quite anything you've got around just to hold the head in a, what they call a neutral position. Thank you, Prof. Uh, there is one more question. Uh, it's about uh, securing the airway in an avulsive injury. Which is the better method to secure the airway, whether going for a trachea or a retrograde? It depends which scenario you're in. I mean, if it's the emergency scenario, you need to get an airway in, an airway this means any airway you can get in. It has to be a definitive airway. A surgical airway, a tracheostomy, in my books, is not, a, is not done as an emergency procedure. It can be done as a control procedure. Uh, and again, if you can do it in a control procedure, then absolutely fine. It's, it's a very safe and secure airway, particularly if the patient is going to be... Um, significantly ventilated or requiring transfer to a CCU and is going to need a lot of ventilatory and physiological support. And then a tracheostomy, if it's going to be long term, is much better than, for example, an oral tracheal tube, which comes with a whole load of issues. And we occasionally get asked, you know, if a patient has significant panfacial fractures and indeed polytrauma, if we wouldn't mind doing a tracheostomy at the time, which is fine. It adds half an hour onto your, to your operating time. Thank you, Prof. Um, one more question we can take. Uh, which is the best method to control hemorrhage in doing anterior and posterior nasal packing, out of pressure packing or Foley's catheter, embolization out of all? Embolization, I wouldn't go for first of all. Finally, just use packing. You know, that, that will control hemorrhage in about 80, 90% of the time, basically, putting anterior and posterior nasal packs. A Foley catheter is dead easy to put in uh, along the floor of the nose uh, and then just inflate it. So these are the, probably the easiest ones to do. And you will probably find that significant amount of hemorrhage will be controlled just simply by doing these simple methods. Embolization, I would only use it would fail to do uh, fail packing, basically. Thank you, Prof. Thank you for uh, spending or uh, sparing your precious time, especially on a Sunday morning. Thank you. Oh, pleasure. Pleasure. Next, uh, next we, we have a lecture by Professor Veera Babu, sir. It is on management of MRH control in general dental practice, which is the most common topic preferred and requested by the general practitioners, the students, undergraduates, the trainees, everyone. Even for the senior practitioners also, Sometimes uh, bleeding, uh, hemesters is a um, controlling bleeding. is a nightmare or uh, it gives sleepless nights for us, whether it is because of uh, uh, iatrogenic causes or bleeding, uh, bleeding disorder, due to bleeding disorders or whatever it is, or intraoperative or postoperative immediate or delayed. Always the hemorrhage is a, um, is a problem for us. Okay, so now we call upon uh, Professor M. Mirabhav, sir, my teacher, to deliver his lecture on management of hemorrhage control in general dental practice. So the screen is yours. Uh, uh, GP, I have a bit of problem in sharing my screen. Okay, Just sir. give me a second. Yeah, yeah, take your time, sir. Take your time. So meanwhile, uh, Prof Andy, the question for you, Prof. So in a, in a multidisciplinary approach, especially during golden hour, a patient comes to you with severe head injury, with uh, neural problems, uh, orbital problems, everything. So how is the approach? Always the maxillar trauma. We say the maxillofacial trauma is not an emergency. So how do we deal with this type of cases? Uh, yeah, I mean, 
Can you see my presentation? Uh, yes, bro. Yes, sir. We can see your screen. So I can take the question to Prof. Handy. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry, sorry for the interruption, Prof. Handy. I had a little glitch. No, right. That's all right. No problem, Vera Moon. I mean, you're absolutely right. I mean, we are low down the, I mean, a lot of panfacial fractures, we will fix three or four days down the line. Um, there's no immediate rush to go in there. You're absolutely right. So um, we would often wait, um, particularly things like orbital trauma, zygoma trauma. We know that. Mandibular trauma is slightly different. But, you, you know, we follow the ATLS protocol, which is established in a secure airway, dealing with any bleeding restoring the circulation, dealing with any disability, uh, making sure the patient's stable, first of all, because there's no point in having a dead patient, um, you know, because you can't fix the facial fractures on, basically. So um, from our viewpoint, it would be a case of, uh, um, and we're very much guided by our neurosurgical colleagues as well, you know, we'll often delay surgery and stuff. So it's unusual for us to go ahead and, and deal with things primarily, basically. And it's often very difficult as well with the amount of swelling. Okay, Prof. How late we can do maxillofacial trauma management? Oh, we've done, well, I've done, I mean, yeah, I've fixed fractures two, three weeks, three, four weeks sometimes. Down. It becomes more difficult, as you know. Um, you know, everything starts to heal very quickly in the, the head and neck region, but I, I have managed to fix facial orbital trauma. Well, oh, God, um, a year, I think, is the latest I've tried to fix, but it's been a healed fracture, so it's it's a post-traumatic injury then. So it becomes that grey area between trauma and then it becomes a post-traumatic injury, if you know what I mean, basically. So, um, you know, anything within three or four weeks is okay, but after that, it becomes very, very difficult. And then you're dealing with a post-traumatic injury or a post-traumatic uh, deformity, and that that's a, 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 a whole different talk. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, Prof. So now, Prof. Prof. Virabhav sir can take the screen. Uh, thank you, Dr. GPK. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. Yes, sir. Thank you, Dr. Jim, Dr. Rina, Dr. GPK, and uh, the Tamil Nadu State Branch, as well as the University of Masha, Vinayagar Mission, and uh, Tahur for giving me this wonderful invite and opportunity. And I was told by Mr. G. Patmanabha Kumar, and I fondly call him GPK. Now, <laughs> this Dr. G. Patmanabha Kumar told me that, uh, sir, make a presentation keeping in mind of the undergraduate and the general practitioner who has asked for this topic. So after listening to that massive hemorrhage from Professor uh, Edward, uh, you are going to see that nagging dental bleeding from the oral cavity and how to manage it. Uh, see, the, either you are a dental surgeon who is doing a general dental practice or uh, you are doing any of this specialty, if you are not doing an exclusive specialty practice, if you are going to do some of the oral surgical practice, what are the oral surgical practice you will be uh, doing? Extractions, open methods, if, if, the, if the tooth breaks or somebody comes with a broken tooth or root, Minor impaction, that is fully erupted wisdom teeth, uh, which you think that you need not send it to a specialist and you want to remove it. And periapical surgeries, at least in the anteriors, and small biopsies, these are the procedures a general dental practitioner will be doing in his practice. If he's not referring to an oral surgeon, it is in our kind of practice in India with a massive population of 130 crores, not all the patients will be coming to the specialist, the general dental practitioner is expected to do uh, attend these kind of cases. I'm sure even in Malaysia, all these uh, patients will not be having, having access to the specialist. And some of you or most of you or few of you will be dealing these cases. So you should know when you get hemorrhage in at the time of extractions or open methods or minor impactions or periapical surgeries or biopsies, what is the protocol or procedure, the algorithm you are going to do to control the hemorrhage? Nobody is going to die of these hemorrhages like this maxillofacial massive casualties and injuries. But these things are very nagging. And uh, unless you do properly and control, the patient is not going to be your patient after this procedure. Why it is more uh, hemorrhage is more common in the oral procedure is it's highly vascular. I know that both sides carotid supplying the face. So it's highly vascular. That is one reason all our extractions heal very well. For information, each extraction is in a compound fracture. If you cause the same kind of injury in the femur, it will become an osteomyelitis. Evolutionally, we have developed some resistance. 
and also due to this high blood supply from the both the carotids our wounds heal very well but unfortunately because of this extreme blood supply and an open wound see every extraction is an open wound that is the the the, the actual source of the bleeding is open to the oral cavity and you can't put a pressure dressing like in other part of the body where if there's a bleeding in your hand or anything you can put a pressure with a, a big pack a gauze or something like that but here you can't put the pressure pack uh, regularly and tongue is in another organ which will keep disturbing the already formed clot and you have salivary enzymes which may lyse the clot later so these are the reasons for bleeding after extractions what what are the usual situation you will see after extraction immediately after the extraction you are a dentist you have done the extraction and the bleeding is not stopping that is a kind of we call it primary hemorrhage you have done the extraction the bleeding is stopped the clotting is formed in the night after 24 hours in the night he calls you saying that doctor had developed a bleed that is third situation where after 24 hours within 7 days they call you that they are having another bleed in all these three situation can happen to your patient or it can happen to somebody else patients that is if you have done the patient and they start bleeding and they come to you you are more emotionally charged you may not follow all the signs but if somebody else patients you are more daring and you will follow all the protocol this is what we have seen but if you follow the protocol which i am going to say that is your patients or other patient you will be able to manage better bleeding could be due to local and systemic and i am going to tell you only about the reasons uh, local reasons the systemic is entirely a different lecture so every patient before you start the extraction you have to ask have they undergone previous extraction in the previous extraction have they had any bleeding episode that is a very important question if they say that no we have not undergone any previous extraction as the whether they have undergone any previous surgery like appendix hernia tonsillectomy if they say they have not had any previous extraction they have not had a previous surgery the third person has have they had any previous accident they had a fall from a cycle they had any suturing on the chin or any cut with the knife or a blade uh, there was there any bleeding because there's a very significant question if they say that they had a torrential bleed then it will give you uh, an idea that they may be having some systemic problem you may also ask some family history because if the family history has got some other bleeding diathesis is a disorder then you should be more careful these are the four questions you should ask before starting your extraction what are the five medication history you will ask five days i call it that the patient is on aspirin that is called anti platelets any newer or old generation anti platelets anti coagulants any old generation or new generation anti coagulants are they on long term antibiotics which can uh disturb the vitamin k formation or the on long term there is a chronic alcoholic which can cause some hepatic disorder or cirrhosis or they on anti cancer which is an anti metabolites and can cause some platelet issues if they are on all these five uh, any one of these five tablets or any one of the five drugs you should be more careful you should assess the patient for bleeding and clotting uh, protocol uh, test should be done for them systemic diseases the hepatitis and hypertension should be ruled out because if there is a liver issues you know factor 279 and uh, will be affected there can be prolonged uh, clotting time and prothrombin time so you we need to evaluate it hypertension in my practice is it's around 160 by systole by 100 we usually do the procedures more than that we refer to the practitioners get it controlled and we do it most of the time people say that the bleeding is due to hypertension hypertension uh, is not a major issue when it comes to bleeding they are more worried about the stroke and cardiac issues we can manage hypertension and we can go ahead with extraction so normally after extraction how do you proceed you place a 2 into 2 inch gauze ask him to bite tightly for half an hour do not take it because every 10 minutes you try to take it the wounds will come and then you will think that the bleeding has not stopped you should give enough time ask him to bite for at least 15 minutes take it out then place a new gauze give a good post operative instruction and send them when you place a, your your a gauze in the extraction socket you should see that because i told you you cannot put a pressure packing you should see to that when they bite 
that gas goes in between the two sockets and compress the socket and controls the bleeding from the gingiva so that the bleeding stops in, in orthodontic cases in between the uh, wires they are sometimes they are not able to put the gas so most of the patient they come back with the bleeding all we do is change the old gas put the gas in between the socket go all the way up to the socket the bleeding stops so what is very important here is a traumatic surgery that is the gentle elevation of gingiva and not crushing like an alveolar purchase crushing the gingiva or the bone and after extraction if the any bone is picked gently remove the bone is picked because these things are reason for the post operative bleeding usually bleeding is from the soft tissue and the hard tissue so how do you know that when it is coming from the soft tissue or the hard tissue so if it you just compress the socket tightly for 10 minutes after 10 minutes you leave it if there is no bleeding then that is coming from the granulation tissue around the socket that is from the soft tissue and even when you are compressing the bleeding is coming from the socket then there is bleeding is coming from inside the bone from union of the nuclear and canals or the inferior alveolar vessel which you need a different kind of management which is not just going to stop with the soft tissue suturing most of the time the the soft tissue bleeding what we have seen in the practice is granulation tissue all this chronic destructive uh, periodontal cases with the granulation tissue or periapical granuloma after you extract the tooth when you leave the granuloma which is rich in vasculature they start bleeding what you do is you put the gauze ask him to uh, tightly bite it and after half an hour or 15 minutes you take it you still see the blood coming what you are missing is you have not removed the granulation tissue so you nicely cure up the socket you remove the granulation tissue you got various forces like uh, at least the tissue holding forces mosquito artery forces and cure ups are that which will beautifully cure out all this granulation tissue which will immediately stop the bleeding but a word of caution is when you are removing the granulation tissue two areas you should be very careful one in the upper six or premolar or seven region where in the curating the granulation tissue you should not enter into the maxillary sinus so one should be very careful and gentle in removing at the roof of the tooth of the 6 or 7 or 8 and also in the lower region in the 6 7 8 region after the extraction you compress the socket for 10 minutes bleeding is not soft you think it is coming from inside the socket if you want to cure up the socket thinking that there is a granulation tissue in a granulation tissue in a curative area you should be very careful because sometimes if there's a thin bone between the inferior alveolar canal and the granuloma you may go and you will may go and injure the inferior alveolar nerve which may result in numbness and patient will be unhappy so you need to be gentle in the inferior alveolar canal region also if necessary you can take put a gauze pack take an iop or opg check the distance between the root end and the nerve canal if there is enough distance you can aggressively curate it if there is very less distance you have to be very careful in removing the granulation tissue most of the time the post operative bleeding which we see in our casualty they stop with this pressure pack or removal of the granulation tissue and a gentle suturing so soft tissue bleeding i said you just compress it the bleeding stops it comes from the soft tissue just suture it pressure and suture will take care nowadays you got a radio frequency diaphragm electrocautery small gingival bleed can be stopped and these are the instruments used which i have shown in the pictures there are other uh, uh, agents which can help you control the bleeding like surgi cell and gel foam and bone wax see when will you use surgi cell and gel foam when you will use a bone wax see that i told you the soft tissue bleeding and the hard tissue bleeding in the soft tissue bleeding you can use after compressing the socket after removing the granulation tissue if you still think that it is coming from the soft tissue you can pack the socket with surgi cell or a gel foam or nowadays you get microfiber or collagen like avicin this is what commonly we use we pack the socket and we do a figure of eight uh, suturing or a horizontal mattress suturing like this just place a sock uh, suture like this put a surgi cell which a trap all the platelets and forms in a artificial clot and this is beautifully forms a clot like this so i would advise all the general practitioners keep at least one uh, herb gel uh, gel foam or this kind of a uh, surgi cell which i love to use it the, and bone wax is an absolute must if you are doing a uh, bone surgery near the third molar area 
and that's the uh, doing near the premolar region, the mental nerve region. If there are some bony bleeding, you can use a bone wax and control. Bone wax is a kind of a wax-like thing. If, if there's a bony bleed from the nutrient canals, or if the bony bleeding from the inferior lateral canal up from the small part, where you, you cannot go and use your cartridge or a diathermy because it will become a numb, pack the socket with uh, bone wax, the bleeding stops. So reactionary hemorrhage, which is what I was telling you, they come to you after 24 hours. Usually check the BP, if the BP is high, try to reduce the uh, systolic pressure. Keep, don't get panic, position the patient, suction the socket. You need a good elimination to know whether it is coming from the soft heart tissue. Don't do anything, pack it for five to 10 minutes. Wait, most important is this five piece, pressure, pack, position and patient. That is the pressure should be for 10 to 15 minutes. Most often I see the young residents keep taking that gauze and keep saying that sir, the bleeding has not stopped. The problem is you are not allowing the natural mechanism to form the clot. So you should give <coughs> enough time for it to clot. So 10 to 15, nobody is going to die of a bleeding from a dental socket after an extraction. So you be patient, you wait for 10 to 15 minutes, the clot will form. And the pack, as I told you, should be adequately packed into the socket. So it goes to the root of the area where the, where the bleeding is starting. Position, keep it in the head down position. Don't go, you keep it in the head up position. And you wait, give the sufficient time. And even then it just doesn't stop, start praying. And this is the bottle section. And I see the general practitioners are using the dental suction tip which is used for their restorative work. I am telling you, if you have this kind of a separate bottle suction, it's a nice thing, stainless steel uh, suction tips, you are able to, with the thin uh, number three or number four, you can go to the source of the bleeding and you know exactly the bleeding is coming and you can decide whether you have to put surgical or gel foam or the bone wax or you have to use thrombin, you have to use a bipolar, radio frequency, cartridge. how do you decide? You should know where the bleeding is coming. To see where the bleeding is coming, you need something which is so small, which go into the area. If you use the other one, that the, the dental uh, plastic tip, you will be, not be able to find out where the bleeding is starting. And this is the ab gel I'm just showing you. This is a gel foam. It absorbs the blood, expands in size, and compress the bleeding spots, and that produces the clot. You can put a figure of a suture like this. See, I am showing in a non-bleeding case for the sake of demonstration. Because when there is an actual hemorrhage coming into a casualty, patient doesn't allow us to take a picture. There the situation won't be as rosy as like this. The patient will have blood around the corner of the mouth, face, his shirt. So you are a young dentist, you should not panic because of one funny incident, one of the patients told me that he went to the patient's the doctor's house and knocked the door. As soon as the doc dentist opened the door, he saw the patient with all the blood on this uh, shirt and everything and he fainted. So the patient always recalled, sir, I have to take the patient doctor to the casualty. And both of us went there and got treated. So do not panic, do not get tense. Following these measures, you can easily control the bleeding because it is not the major maxillofacial massive hemorrhage from the maxillary artery, which Professor Edward showed in his cases. These are coming from the dental socket and you will be able to manage if you follow the standard protocol. Another the local agent, which I already told you, gel foam, surgical collagen. So of course, some of us used the thrombin. And by using this thing, we can control the primary and reactionary hemorrhage. That is one, which is not stopping immediately even after extracting it. The reactionary hemorrhage is they go home, they knock your door in the night after 24 hours or 12 hours. Second day hemorrhage, the patient is absolutely fine for some time and they call you on third or fourth day because of infection or some other disturbance, the clot get lysed and they come to you with the bleeding. You know that it is mostly due to the infection or disturbance of the clot. So give a nice block, anesthetize the patient nicely so that the uh, blood pressure comes down, they don't have the pain, they're comfortable. Cure the area if the old clot or, and the gold granulation tissue, put size surgical, cell, which is my favorite, you can put gel foam, put a nice figure of a sutures, put a pack and start them on antibiotics. Become alert when you see somebody with a lot of bleeding coming out of the mouth after the extraction, after three days or four days, they come to you. 
keep everything ready but don't panic because when you panic your mind doesn't work then you don't know what to do you need to observe the patient also as a whole imagine this patient came to us uh, last month and they were trying to do a lower wisdom tooth eight uh, one of the intern was doing i went and told her see look at the lip what is that she didn't know what it is it is a small av malformation and if you by accidentally injure that area the control of bleeding is going to be difficult and your extraction should be very careful and we told her put a cheek retractor as the assistant to keep this area away from the injury and we gently removed the tooth so when you are examining the area near the tooth around the tooth the tongue you have to look for all these uh, things because sometime we get a patient in the casualty once we got a, they, they tried to remove a lower wisdom tooth in a, and unfortunately it turned out to be a case of av malformation and we need to ship the patient for selective embolization to control the bleeding but there is one unfortunate event but which could not have been found when we took an opg we saw a huge av malformation which the attending dentist have missed it so but you should know that when a bleeding is massive and is not getting controlled with the standard protocol or algorithm which i told you now then you should think of something sinister should call the maxillofacial surgeon or any other specialist who is involved in major surgical procedure you should not waste time ship the patient and control the hemorrhage because of ego you should not be wasting too much time and by the time we go to the clinic or hospital they should not say you come too late and just small some surgical anatomy when you are trying to do a open methods when you are trying to make a vertical incision uh, like this at the at the at the lower end of the thing theoretically speaking you can injure the facial artery which is coming and taking a turn here so when you are making the vertical incision for your wisdom tooth or a thermolar it should not go too much into the soft tissue and you should not be too rough in that area very rarely you may nick one wall of the facial artery the bleeding will be difficult to control you may may have to get access from extra oral so this is the region i hope you can see my arrow you are be careful and in this iopa you can see these two lines that's line showing the canals the inferior alveolar canal that very close to the root of the third molar imagine if this tip breaks here and you are trying to split and take this to roots you should be aware that you are if you are using a fine micro motor with the 701 or 7r3 bar not everybody is fortunate to have piezo which will not injure the vessel they say they claim at least Uh, if you are using a nice tension curve, a bar, rotating bar, if you are not careful that at what depth you are going, you may nick this uh, inferior alveolar nerve, and that may cause a bleeding, which may need a bone max to control. But remember, if you remove the tooth, then it is easy to put a bone max and control the bleeding. But you have nicked this inferior alveolar canal before removing the tooth, you will find it difficult to put the bone max. Sometimes we put the bone max, close the socket, and after Seven days we go back and remove the tooth. So you should, whenever there is eight region, the tooth is fractured. Don't start your open method or surgical uh, removal. Go take the X-ray, check where the inferior or now canal, or is there any pathology around the eight? Then proceed the, with the case because sometimes in the clinical practice you attempt to eight with the next uh, without X-ray. If fractures, you start proceeding it and getting into trouble. Do not do that mistake. always take the x ray and start proceeding and this is just a soft tissue thing if you are taking a biopsy with a simple interrupted suture you can get a good uh, bleeding control if you are doing any surgery on the palatal side there is a huge cyst as a part and cyst one of my colleague is removing it you should need to say that there is an artery coming here is called nasopalatine artery sometimes if you are removing sorry sometime if you are uh, removing uh, this periapical cyst on the palatal side you need to understand that you might have to catch the nasopalatal artery with a clamp cut it cauterize it and then you can remove the cyst but suppose if you accidentally cut the nasopalatal artery nothing is going to happen take your mosquito artery forceps catch it and crush it or use a bipolar and cauterize it if you don't have access to bipolar or the monopolar <coughs> all you have to do is put a nice pressure on that foramen or put the palatal tissue back on the palate and compress it 10 minutes 
the bleeding will stop and take a intrapapillary suture suture to the labial papilla the bleeding will stop remember pressure pack position patients even if you can't control just hold on to the bleeding site with a pack we even say to the postgraduates if they can't control the bleeding just hold on to it and call for help as long as your pressure is there even on the carotids the bleeding will stop the panic we try to do something else then we are not able to control the bleeding it is the pressure pack position patients which is very important in controlling hemorrhage whether it's a maxillofacial hemorrhage or the dental hemorrhage of course as i told you diabetic patients or uh, immunocompromised patients they have got uh, some most of the time they have got a, a chronic destructive periodontitis cases the granulation tissue those patients tend to bleed more people say the diabetic patients tend to bleed more because not because of the diabetic situation or hyperglycemia because these patients most of them in our part of the country tend to have poor oral hygiene and chronic destructive periodontitis the granulation tissue causes continuous bleeding which i told you already that you cure the granulation tissue tissue the bleeding stops and you need to be careful with the children and pregnant patient you take extra precautions to avoid bleeding in these cases because they are special the children with the low blood volume and pregnant patients with other uh, systemic uh, issues going on is difficult to position them and difficult to stress them so in my opinion take extra precautions and avoid bleeding in these patients if there is a bleeding follow the standard protocol pressure pack position patients and putting surgical gel foam figurophate sutures will take care of the bleeding tuberosity fracture is one of the nagging one when you are removing the upper eight teeth if you are putting the cryo elevator or whatever technique which in your part of the country and your unit they are teaching you with a gentle pressure the teeth is not moving my advice to you is to do an open method and remove the upper eight upper eight wisdom teeth most of the time people give a little brute force they they fracture the tuberosity and we have had patients people are removed uh, seven and eight together with a massive hemorrhage where we had to do a ecl ligation in one case because they try to control the bleeding they injured the maxillary artery and patient has to be shifted to the general anesthesia to control the hemorrhage even with a pack it was bleeding to the nose and we had to get the carotid control one rare case so tuberosity fracture is quite common if you are not careful in the control of pressure in the removal of the upper eight and if you are very careful you will not cause problem if it's a minor tuberosity fracture dentally dissect it out and take it out and the bleeding can be controlled with the pressure and a nice suture with a surgical or a gel foam in the alveolar vessels as i already told you you can manage with bone wax do not put diathermy or cautery because the chances for numbness is there patient may not ferig you for a numbness when they come to you for a simple eight extraction or six extraction sometimes you see this kind of fracture in the mandible which like our professor edward showed the casualties the cases come to you suppose if you are practicing in the peripheral village or a, a, a away a town where a patient walks into a practice with a fallen from a cycle or a motorbike with an injury in the anterior region all you have to do is just pass a wire around the teeth and tighten it the bleeding will stop i have been called sometime into major hospital by other specialists that they tried suturing they put surgical gel foam nothing stop i go around put a wire around to tighten it and approximate the fragment so the bleeding stops this as a dental surgeon and oral surgeons and a maxillofacial surgeon we should know approximation of the fracture fragment the best way to stop a bleeding in the facial maxillary trauma of course maxillary fractures do definitely shown by professor edwards like anterior nasal pack and posterior nasal pack that is beyond the scope of a general dental practitioner if you are a maxillofacial surgeon already professor has explained to you in detail anterior nasal posterior nasal and all the epithet catheters and the latest techniques there to control the anterior and nasal bleeding and the posterior nasal bleeding simple dental alveolar injuries and bleeding as i told you just reduce the dental alveolar injury put the alveolus back into position put an impression compound or the wire or the your composite reduce the fragment suture the wound the bleeding will stop uh, most important thing as uh, if there are some students for the undergraduates i do not advise posterior superior alveolar block i do not know whether dr g patmanav kumar is advising it 
some of the units are advising this for posterior extraction but the students go in and injure the plexus and causes huge hematoma i would always tell that just infiltrate near the upper 8 or 7 and extract because the maxilla porous bone they get good anesthesia can an extraction you need not go and do a posterior superior alveolar block for a simple extraction and if you are not aspirating if you are not twice aspirating if you are not turning the syringe and aspirating you may injure the plexus and it may terigard plexus and that bleeding it's not life threatening or it is not nagging but the whole cheek will swell and that the swelling will take some time and if it is a very fair person it changes his color color over a period of 15 days and they will be keep calling you so you need to be careful with these patients is another case this guy if i remember i had a christmas disease or factor 9 deficiency landed with us for that time the we used to some perichlorate is to control the bleeding then later he was sent to the hematologist and factor 9 replacement was done to control his bleeding so to conclude i told you how to control the local measures pressure pack position patience and prayer i said gel foam surgical bone wax with this eight you can control intraoral hemorrhage if you know figure of eight suturing vertical matter suturing horizontal matter suturing complete pressure if you can maintain it you can control hemorrhage what patient systemic thing nowadays we get two group of patients and different countries have got a different protocol and system either patient is on anticoagulation like warfarin and comedy like old uh, uh, anticoagulant now the recent uh, directly acting anticoagulants are also there this patient comes to you for extraction what full they do a bridge therapy what they do is they stop this anticoagulation medication and they substitute with the heparin and 6 hours before they stop the heparin then they do the procedure 6 hours they start later they start and they proceed that is one way called bridge therapy but if you stop this some of the cardiologists or the some of the general physician i am not sure they just simply stop this medicine and they ask you to do the extraction but the potential chance for them to develop another stroke or an attack is very high so i wouldn't advise you to stop this anticoagulation medication if the inr international normalized ratio is maintained anywhere between 2 and 2.5 up to that there are all systemic reviews and studies published and nice protocols are there nobody stops nowadays warfarin or comedin for extraction or a simple extraction non complicated extraction one tooth extraction if they are on multiple drugs i would advise you to take in a medical opinion you need to discuss with your medical practitioner whether need do to do a bridge therapy or you can go ahead and put a gel foam and control the bleeding so this is inr patients prothrombin time by lab prothrombin time normally it is one up to 2.5 you can manage with gel foam surgical bone wax or any one of the local agents to control the bleeding normally the bleeding stops by itself the bleeding clotting does not form you can use any one of those machines which i taught you now if the inr is up to more than 2.5 you need to discuss with the physician because in my part of the country where we are not duly qualified if there is an hemorrhage without consulting our physician there are some medical legal issues so we always take the consent and the opinion from the general practitioner i am sure professor edward and professor sambrook with the duly qualified with their board they may be going ahead doing it uh, this is the protocol we are follow here but what about the anti platelets like aspirin we don't stop uh, stop it uh, the newer generation anti platelets also we don't stop because these things are not an a major issue the, uh, the bleeding stops by itself if it does not stop we can always use a surgical cell and close it it stops by itself but if they are using multiple anti platelets if you use clopidogrel if you use aspirin along with that if you use some of the anticoagulants for other atrial fibrillations or other uh, other disorders then you need to discuss with the physician titrate the patient take all precautions then you go her extraction but if you stop anti platelets that is these drugs without consulting them for worrying about bleeding they may end up having another stroke or another attack in that case the patient may continue then if there is a medical board will say that why did you stop this potential drug because of this only he developed because there are various reports nowadays telling 
their patients are more prone when you stop these antiplatelets. So you need to have a very clear discussion with the treating physician if you are planning to stop these drugs for doing three or four to extraction or whole quadrant implants, please discuss with your anesthetist or intensivist or your physician before taking up the case. So these are the anticoagulants and antiplatelet protocols we follow. Nowadays, because of this uh, life expectancy is more and you see elderly patients, we are trying to do everything in a day and this medically compromised patients, if you are not well equipped, well prepared, well advised, we may land up in trouble. So, so follow the international protocol, follow the evidence-based science, you will come out in flying color with successful. So if you fail to prepare, so you're actually preparing yourself to fail. I'm sure that will not happen to you because you are all an excellent under the hands of Dr. G. Patmanabha Kumar, an excellent professors. So with this, I conclude my lecture. Thank you, Dr. G. PK for a wonderful opportunity. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much. Once again, your lecture is so interesting and elaborate as usual, and very informative for the undergraduates and general practitioners. Now, there are a few questions for you, sir. Yeah. How to pick up AV malformations and avoid procedures routinely? See, these AV malformations routinely, they are not going to come to you all. Once in a while, by, by inspection itself, you will see the case which I showed you. You saw it in the lip. It's a venous malformation. You can, when you, when you palpate itself, will be no. So inspection and palpation and brewery and all these things will tell you to compress it and leave it. It starts filling because hemangioma comes in younger age. It resolves by itself. AV malformation persists. So this, if there's a central hemangioma, you may not be able to get it. So in that case, you need to take X-rays, routine X-rays for all these patients. But we are, uh, uh, we, I do not know about your protocol. In Malaysia, do you take routine uh, intraoral periapical x ray for all these cases? No, sir. No, routine. No, routine. So, so routine cases, we can't pick it up. It's, it's a fate of luck. We sometimes get cases, people extracted the tooth on this intraosseous AV malformation and we managed it. But if it's a soft tissue once, by inspection itself, we can pick it up. So what is your opinion on the patients on multiple oral anticoagulants? Yeah, multiple oral anticoagulants, I will definitely refer to my physician, take the opinion of him. But only thing I will put my thoughts to him, if he's not updated contemporary physician. Sometimes I'm, 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 sometime I come across physicians who are not keeping update with the latest protocol and they will tell stop this, stop that. So we need to be confident of the person we are referring. And if there are multiple things, I would like to go for a bridge therapy, which I told you. I will stop three days before. They give heparin. They will stop six hours uh, before. Then we stop it uh, to the procedures, start again, and slowly replace it with your anticoagulants. So, so one, one question from one of the student. Yeah. Uh, My patient had a hemorrhage from 2-6 extracted site throughout the night. Yeah. So what could be the reason how to handle this case? Actually, I should not be giving the reason because I have not seen your patient. That is not correct. I can imagine various reasons. See, first of all, have you taken the history? If the history does not have, see if, he's not, if the patient is not a hemophilia, if the patient is not an Aran Willibrand disease, the patient is not having any Christmas disease, or the patient is not a thrombocytopenia, any one of the medical problem, then you know there is no systemic causes. If they are not taking any medication, it is not due to drug. If it is a healthy patient whom you have done the extraction, then what does that mean? You have not compressed the socket, you have not controlled the bleeding from the gingiva, you have not put the pressure pack properly. One, or you have done everything, he has taken it, he has dislodged the clot with his tongue, and uh, there is some bony spicule, there could be some granulation tissue. We don't know. We have to inspect the case, or the person who attended the case only can give the reason. What I am telling you is are multiple possible reasons, local and systemic. You rule out systemic first. The local soft tissue and hard tissue. Compress the socket, bleeding stop, soft tissue. Suturing will take care. Even after compressing, it does not stop. It is coming from the socket. Look for granulation tissue. Even after removing granulation tissue, if it doesn't stop, Look for nutrient vessels or some other vessel which can be controlled with the bone wax and suturing. 
but all this time the bp should be monitored a drug history should be taken that the, the family history to be taken for other bleeding disorder i had a case where everything was done sent to the hematologist and he gave a clearance because the patient gave a history of bleeding from his palm after he just a expedition to some uh, uh, hill or something what happens 14 days later he developed a bleeding he told me so i did all bleeding and clotting tests referred to a hematologist post operatively after i removed the eight third day he started bleeding we didn't know uh, every test is normal taken that this thing then he was referred to a hematologist that time he told he is it could be a mild hemophilia because during the stress level these patients start bleeding so when they gave factor 8 assay the bleeding stopped the patient's parents did not tell the patient himself that he is a case of mild hemophilia otherwise the patient was a perfect patient on that day only the patient came to know that he is a mild hemophilic patient is a peculiar case i had in my practice thank you sir can iop give any different signs of av malformations no i don't think we can't okay thank you sir actually here we have a strict protocol sir because of medical issues if any patient gives any history of traumatic extractions or any history of bleeding disorders or any other uh, bleeding problems then we refer the patient to the physician or to the hematologist we get the return return expert opinion based upon their opinion we touch the patient we decide whether to proceed or not okay so this this medical opinion is given by your medical colleague if i am correct yes sir yes sir okay yeah, that that's the same here also but we are the only thing i would be very uh, this thing is i i should have confidence in my physician whether he is following the standard international protocol especially the patients on long term uh, blood thinners will have a note with them a detailed report with them report with them and based upon that we proceed sir okay thank you sir thank you thank you thank you sir have a great evening sir thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you sir so now So thank you next. doctor yeah okay. dr gpk yeah thank you dr gpk for that uh, moderation and those wonderful lectures that we heard from professor andy and professor virabau i think there's one uh, uh, question to dr virabau about uh, if there is any uh, recent article uh, regarding uh, systemic uh, uh, causes for uh, bleeding from extraction socket is there anything like that you want to add on dr virabau I, I'm not sure what recent article they are uh, okay. putting. Okay. Okay. Any, so I any, think yeah, yeah. Recent guidelines for systemic causes. That's what they've asked. <laughs> yeah. See, are basically, you are going to see if the patient you are going to take the history. If it's an ang patient, if there is no systemic problem, what is that to worry? If they yes. give the family history of hemophilia, family history of if the patient is having some other uh, bleeding problem or issue, yes. then you take the history. Yes. Yes. Then you do bleed time, clotting time, prothrombin time, partial thrombin time, platelet exactly. counts, and exactly. you do INR on all those uh, profiles. Then take a hematologist opinion. Then you proceed with that. Yes, Doctor Virabha, we got that very clear. A detailed case history is very important, very important, and then following it up with a proper observation of the patient, and then relevant investigations and proper inference of the investigations, yeah. and then I think that's the protocol Family you're talking about. Family history is what sometimes yes. they are they are missing with. Yes, Doctor Virabal. Thank you so much for that answer. Uh, so we move on further for the next lecture by Professor Doctor Sam Brook, who's going to talk to us on management of potentially malignant disorders. So from bleeding, we are going on to potentially malignant disorders. Professor Sam Brook. Sorry, I had a little bit of trouble getting myself off mute. Um, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to uh, talk. And uh, on this St. Valentine's Day, I wish uh, all the panelists and uh, 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 attendees the, uh, the peace and love that the world can bring. So uh, um, 
we'll move on to potentially malignant uh, disorders uh, here. As you know, there's been quite a lot of change in uh, terminology and uh, um, in this area where we used to have pre-malignant lesions, pre-malignant conditions, and the World Health Organization and many other uh, researchers have grappled with these uh, sorts of issues. So we're going to have a look a little bit about assessment, uh, the risk factors, the uh, carcinogenesis, uh, the way things progress in, into, uh, into cancer. And this should dovetail uh, uh, very nicely into uh, Professor Vijay's talk uh, coming up uh, next. So we'll talk about uh, some anatomy and some subsites, a little tiny bit on it, epidemiology, and then onto risk factors the pathogenesis, and then, uh, of course, some potentially malignant conditions. And I certainly don't intend to have a talk about uh, extensive lists of pre-malignant uh, uh, conditions and go through each of them individually, but we will talk a little bit about uh, the uh, more philosophical basis of, uh, of malignancy. As we all know, um, head and neck cancer is more common in several regions of the world. And the oral cavity, including the tongue, is most common in the Indian sub subcontinent. Nasopharyngeal, uh, more common in Southeast Asia, and pharyngeal and or laryngeal more common in other populations. Uh, but we're not going to talk about those particular conditions here. It is suggested that uh, there's about 650,000 cases worldwide and over 300,000 deaths. And in the past, uh, males were affected significantly more than females, although these figures are getting a little bit closer together simply because uh, of the change in risk factors and also the change of, uh, uh, of uh, you know, pre-malignancy and cancerogenesis. Primary risk factors, uh, as we all know, tobacco use and alcohol con consumption and uh, HPV um, is more uh, significant in oropharyngeal cancer rather than oral cancer, but we'll talk a little bit about that. And of course, the Epstein-Barr virus in nasopharyngeal uh, cancer. I don't want to go through too much of this, but uh, the boundaries of the oral cavity um, are as uh, suggested here. And there are some subsites uh, within the oral cavity that perhaps have different uh, ways that they, they behave. This is according to the American Joint Committee on Cancer. So the, uh, the subsites being the, the lips, the buccal mucosa, the oral part of the tongue, the anterior two thirds, the floor of mouth, maxilla, alveolar ridge and retromolar trigone, and may have different behaviors and may require some different treatments. Although um, ultimately the treatment may well be the same for a lot of these. In Australia, where I'm from, just to give you a little bit of a flavour, oral cancer accounts for roughly 5% uh, of all cancers in Australia, and we have um, a very high incidence of melanoma, uh, particularly in some of our northern climates. And in some areas, uh, oral cancer accounts for 8 to 10% of all cancers. Uh, we have an incidence of 5 to 10 per 100,000 per year, with a mortality of 2 to 3 per 100,000. Again, this male predilection in Australia is about 3 to 1. And the risk of oral cancer does increase with age, uh, although we are now seeing a very much larger increase in patients with uh, younger cancers. And we're now seeing quite a number of people in their 20s and 30s that we weren't seeing, you know, perhaps 20 or 30 years ago. Squamous cell carcinoma represents the vast majority of what we're talking about here. Uh, conventional squamous cell carcinoma, about 90%. I would put some of these subtypes as really falling into a conventional uh, subtype, particularly Verruca's carcinoma. And it's sometimes easy to think of Verruca's carcinoma as as maybe not so severe or, or, or uh, you know, easier to treat. But clearly, it's a conventional squamous cell that is a little bit more exophytic than uh, endophytic. But the others, the spindle cell carcinomas, papillary uh, 
the squamous cell carcinoma is basaloid, and the others there uh, can be uh, can behave a little bit uh, differently. The other malignancies that uh, generally are not involved in the pre-malignant uh, conditions include uh, sarcomas, salivary gland tumors, mucosal melanoma, very unusual disease. Usually when it occurs in the oral cavity, it is very difficult to uh, treat and often has a poor prognosis. And then lymphoma and metastatic diseases. Okay, so let's move on to, the, uh, to what we're actually uh, talking about today and that is these conditions. So the risk factors in oral squamous cell carcinoma, smoking, uh, definitely. And the heavier you smoke, uh, the greater the risk. If you start smoking at uh, age 12, 13 or 14, which uh, many people did 30 or 40 years ago, then uh, uh, the risk is higher. And also the duration, particularly those who have been smoking more than 30, 35 years. In our institution, uh, for a long time, 95% of individuals with oral cancer had a smoking history. As I said, that is changing somewhat now. And some of the more recent figures show a lower rate of smoking in some of our cancers. People think that maybe chewing non-smoking non tobaccos uh, uh, may be uh, uh, a little bit better, but they have an associated risk of oral cancer. And it's the uh, uh, nitrosamines uh, and the carcinogens, uh, uh, the nitrosono uh, norno nicotine, and uh, the other the other uh, carcinogenic agents that are in the uh, tobacco that actually cause the uh, the change to cancer. So it's not just the smoke itself or the uh, um, the, the heat. And alcohol consumption. Um, by itself is an independent risk factor, but it also is a promoter and has a, uh, a multiplier effect and a synergistic effect with tobacco. And heavy drinkers and heavy smokers have more, uh, greater than 20 times the risk of, uh, of squamous cell carcinoma. Beetle nut chewing or the beetle quid, I should really say the Eureka nut um, increases risk uh, by about eight times. And again, if people uh, chew the, uh, the beetle quid uh, and smoke, then the risk uh, can be up to 123 times greater than uh, without either of those two uh, uh, factors. And the beetle quid um, is also uh, uh, involved in uh, uh, other cancers also. HPV is uh, where a lot of research uh, is coming, coming through, uh, as I've suggested. Um, HPV is not necessarily uh, associated with so highly with, with oral cancer, uh, but is certainly uh, associated with oropharyngeal cancer at about 45 to 67%. These tend to be the younger, non-tobacco, non-alcohol users, and also um, very much more, uh, a more equal sex distribution uh, uh, than the tobacco uh, and alcohol. Ones. Unfortunately, early lymph node metastases uh, occur in HPV-associated uh, cancers, and HPV-16 and 18 are associated with the oral cancer. Other infections, Epstein-Barr virus, HSV, HCV, uh, can also be uh, associated with, uh, with uh, uh, oral cancer. And chronic hyperplastic candidiasis, I, I'm very, very wary whenever I get a diagnosis back of uh, chronic hyperplastic candidiasis, as I do with any diagnosis that tells me that uh, the lesion is a squamous proliferative lesion. Both of these diagnoses are very, very highly um, associated with, with oral cancer, uh, oral squamous cell carcinoma, and uh, really, uh, if, uh, if I get a chronic hyperplastic candidiasis or a, a squamous proliferative lesion back as a diagnosis, I, I do treat that as, a, uh, as an early cancer and may do a, uh, uh, an early, uh, just a, a low resection on that to get a proper diagnosis. So the pre-malignant lesions uh, that used to be called the leukoplakia, 
a straight leukoplakia or a white patch has a low risk of malignant progression. A erythroplakia has got a, a much higher risk of malignant progression and the so-called speckled or mixed uh, lesions, uh, a lot of them are actually uh, carcinomas when they first present. An oral lichen planus, straight oral lichen planus, uh, um, has a malignant transformation rate of about 0.2 to 5%. And although it's always put down as a, a pre-malignant uh, type lesion or condition, straight oral lichen planus probably uh, is not as risky as some of the other issues. HIV, uh, two to three fold increase in the incidence of head and neck malignancies. And uh, we're seeing a lot uh, in our hospital uh, of uh, solid organ transplantation, uh, particularly the immunosuppressive agents or the anti-rejection medications that these people are, are on. Um, the majority of these uh, uh, people develop cutaneous malignancies um, and about 1% uh, tongue and other mucosal sites. However, uh, once they seem to get one, it does seem to progress. And we've just got a gentleman in our hospital at the moment who's really onto his fourth or fifth oral uh, carcinoma uh, following a heart transplant approximately 15 years ago. So other risk factors, uh, increasing age, poor diet, nutrition, a lot of genetic factors, occupational exposure and radiation exposure. In order to discuss any of these uh, uh, topics, uh, we really need to have a look at uh, what the normal cell cycle is and uh, how uh, the cell cycle is interfered with, with the various uh, um, cytokines first and then the, the carcinogenic uh, agents, uh, particularly in some of the mitotic phases uh, and the mitogenic uh, uh, signaling areas and the synthesis phases of uh, uh, of the cell cycle. And labile cells uh, such as epithelium and bone marrow um, are the ones that are most at risk of these uh, ongoing carcinogenic effects. So progression through each stage of the cell cycle requires this interaction between cyclins and cyclin dependent kinases. And this is very important because interference with, uh, with any of these can remove protective influences or can add in uh, significant uh, mitogenic uh, influences. Tumor suppression genes uh, are activated uh, when DNA damage is uh, detected at the checkpoints. And so uh, changing uh, some of these tumor suppressor genes uh, or the way they're activated can cause uh, tumor uh, development. So the cell cycle also contains uh, DNA repair genes, apoptotic genes that, uh, that cause the cell uh, to die and uh, uh, immune surveillance, which protects our body from uh, uh, changes in the cell cycle uh, where uh, defective cells, and there are probably thousands of these uh, types of cells uh, generated at every cell cycle, but the body through its immune surveillance, through ap apoptosis, through the repair genes are able to get rid of these so they don't go on uh, to cause tumours. So carcinogenesis in its, uh, in its simplest form uh, requires initiation. Uh, so there are initiate cells that uh, uh, get past the immune surveillance and get past the repair mechanisms. So cells with unrepaired DNA damage complete a cycle of division in which the genetic mutations are copied. So therefore, this is where, this is cell one, as it were, the first cell that causes the tumor. And you remember every single tumor, the, uh, the, the tumor itself is a uh, development of a single cell line. And this forms uh, initiated cells. So once you have these initiate cells, you then can have uh, promotion or clonal expansion. So every single cell is identical and there are the normal mechanisms to prevent this, this cellular growth. So uh, promoters uh, stimulate these initiate cells. They lead to hyperplasia 
of both the normal and the initiated cells. So that's why these, these tumors start to look uh, and proliferate. And there's a, a, an opportunity for further accumulation of multiple mutations. And then you have pro progression with tumor growth with the increase in tumor size and development of malignancy. And uh, these tumors are able to, uh, to enhance or stimulate angiogenesis and the induction of stroma uh, leading to local invasiveness formation of distant metastases. So these cells grow in places that they shouldn't normally uh, grow. And as we've said, the hallmarks of malignancy going back to the cell cycle are uh, self-sufficiency and growth signaling. So the, the cells grow without any boundaries. They, have, they are insensitive to growth inhibiting signals. They evade uh, apoptosis. They have a limitless replication potentials. And there are a number of research cell lines, which are tumor cell lines, which are essentially uh, the, uh, the fountain of youth, the eternal life. They have sustained angiogenesis and they have the ability to invade and metastasize. So if you have a look at the main players uh, in this, particularly in oral uh, cavities, you have a gain in some oncogenes. So you have activation of epidermal growth factors, uh, activations of uh, genes coding for self-signaling. You activate cyclin D and E, and so you get cell cycle uh, progression. And then you get loss of the tumor suppressor genes. So therefore uncovering or allowing these things to grow. The retinoblastoma uh, gene uh, mutation leads to release of uh, transcription factors and DNA replication and P53. So greater than 50% of primary head and neck SCCs have a P53 mutation. And this uh, mutation leads to a decreased cell cycle arrest and DNA repair. And uh, the incidence of this P53 mutation is much higher in smokers and drinkers. You get uh, activation of tele telomerase, which is uh, again the cell cycle. And this turns off apoptosis. So you get cell cycles just continuing to cycle. And early in carcinogenesis, you get uh, deletion of this region of, the, uh, of a chromosome. And this uh, uh, acts really as a uh, tumor suppressor by binding to cyclin D1. And so it regulates progression through the G1 and S phases in the cell cycle. And then P16 inactivation leads to cell cycle dysregulation and therefore uh, uh, moving to tumor. So the mechanism of HPV then uh, differs to smokers and tobacco users because HPV viral oncoproteins degrade and inactivate tumor suppressor genes rather than mutating them. HPV 16 and 18 uh, encode for these two oncoproteins, which degrade uh, P53 and riboflavin there. So P16 thus is a surrogate marker of the presence of HPV. So you can't measure um, the uh, uh, HPV itself, but you can measure uh, the overexpressed uh, P16 uh, uh, protein. And for those of us who are um, uh, more than 18 that are on this teleconference, probably remember uh, uh, the World Health Organization through the 80s and uh, um, uh, Professor Pinborg uh, and his uh, work in uh, uh, dysplasia, hyperplasia, um, and um, the arguments that occurred uh, really on what constituted mild, moderate or severe dysplasia, um, really whether um, epithelium went through stages of hyperplasia, mild, moderate and severe dysplasia, then to carcinoma in situ and invasive carcinoma. And really uh, probably the, the, the sequence is that, that there's a field change and the dysplasia occurs either as mild, moderate or severe, and uh, the invasive car carcinoma occurs in that same area also. So these are the, uh, the, the changes that, you occur, that occur in some of these uh, uh, areas. And in all of these areas, there is genomic instability. And so therefore, the opportunity for cancers to develop 
and hence we're starting to develop the, uh, the concept of uh, pre-malignancy. In terms of patient assessment for all of these, uh, these types of things, uh, you need, uh, as we were talking about in the previous, history is absolutely important here. What is the onset and duration of the lesion? Uh, what is the risk factor assessment? What are, the, uh, what are the symptoms? What are the constitutional symptoms? What does the lesion look like? And what does the neck feel like? And this goes through all of your both pre-malignant lesions and malignant uh, lesions. In some of these, you may need to have a uh, pan endoscopy. You may need baseline uh, blood tests. You may need, you certainly will need some sort of imaging, you know, uh, ultrasound, CT scan with contrast, and then MRI. And uh, CT with, uh, with contrast is often, you know, for, for most of these uh, 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 tumours is in fact uh, the best uh, assessment. Although now for extent, particularly tongue, uh, we've started using MRI and uh, PET-CT uh, likewise. I'm sorry, I'm going through this a little bit uh, quickly. I don't want to uh, uh, continue uh, uh, for, long, for too long here. But really this is where I wanted to get to. Histology is still the gold standard here. So biopsy is absolutely required for histopathological assessment. And these are the white patches, the red patches, any, any, uh, um, any sorts of uh, lesions that you find here. So measure the lesion, photograph the lesion, ensure you've got an adequate depth uh, of the uh, lesion. And if the lesion is large, consider several biopsies from different size, because as I've said, whenever I get a, um, a diagnosis of squamous proliferative lesion, I know that that, that diagnosis is, uh, is just an observation about what has been sent. And really other areas may well have different, uh, different areas of either dysplasia or uh, in fact, uh, frank carcinoma. So when we talk about the concept of pre-cancer pre and the nomenclature, and then we have these uh, uh, potentially malignant disorders, as, as I said, I'm not going to talk about each one of these in a separate, uh, separate uh, activity. So pre-cancer in longitudinal studies uh, are areas of tissue with certain alterations in clinical appearance that identified in the first assessment as precancerous. And then during follow-up have uh, undergone malignant change. So you go back and look at all of those followers. This is what Pinborg did uh, throughout the seventies and eighties. And you've got to remember some of these alterations, particularly the red and white patches are seen to coexist in areas of over squamous cell carcinoma. And hence, you know, the pathway of progression may not be as simple, uh, mild to moderate to severe dysplasia to frank carcinoma. Proportion of these may share morphological and cytopathological changes uh, that you do observe in epithelial malignancy, but without an invasion. And these are the dysplasias. And some of the chromosomal, genomic and molecular alterations found in clearly invasive oral cancers are detected in some of these precancerous or pre-malignant phases that uh, these, uh, these tumours went through. And um, some of the pa papers of um, uh, this gentleman here, who I won't uh, insult him by trying to pronounce his name, and Isaac van der Waal, who they worked, uh, worked together in the sort of 80s, 90s, and into the 2000s. So in terms of nomenclature, we used to think of precancerous, precursor, pre-malignant, intra-epithelial neoplasia carcinoma in situ. So these terms broadly describe the clinical presentations that have the potential to become cancer. However, it's unlikely there is uniformity, as I've previously said, and I need to emphasize in the way individual patients present or behave. Finally, the World Health Organization, after many years of argument, uh, in 2005 came up with the term potentially malignant disorders. So these are all the lesions and conditions that may transform into cancer. They also convey that these are indicators of, of risk of likely future malignancy elsewhere in clinically and normal 
or clinically normally appearing oral mucosa. So it's moved away from the previous classification of, you know, some 20 years previously of uh, precancer lesions and conditions, so pre-malignant lesion and conditions. So they're all lumped now into this pre-malignant disorder. And just to just to round this off, you know, let's just have a brief talk about um, uh, leukoplakia, a white plaque of questionable risk having excluded other known diseases or disorders. And as you can see here, uh, we've had a bit of difficulty with what constitutes a white patch. But finally, the World Health Organization tells us uh, it's not defined, no distinction is made from other white patches. So the pre-malignant white patches are not different from other white patches. And leukoplakia should be used to recognize white plaques, not plagues, of questionable risk, having excluded other known diseases or disorders that carry no risk for cancer. So if you diagnose a white patch as something that is not uh, leading to, to cancer, it's no longer a leukoplakia. It belongs to that condition that it, uh, that it is. And leukoplakia can, uh, can be used at various levels of certainty. It can be a clinical term or a clinico-pathological term. Prevalence of leuko leukoplakia about 2%. Again, malignant transformation, 0.5 to 1% six times more common in smokers. And this is, again, some of Pinborg's and Van der Waal's work. Um, this is one of the hallmarks of smoking. One of the, the white patches, the hyperkeratosis, are hallmarks of, uh, of smokers and alcohol being an independent factor. So these homogenous white patches, as you see in the upper photograph, um, are probably uh, benign type, type lesions. However, if you have a look closer to that photograph, it is not homogenous. The main white patch is homogenous, but more anteriorly, there is a non-homogenous uh, uh, second white patch that leads into it and some, some uh, ruffling of the surface. So if the white patch is homogenous, uniformly flat, thin, shallow, um, or is it non-homogenous? And you could probably say that this lower dive, lower picture, is likely to be, even at presentation, a squamous cell carcinoma. This is a speckled erythroleukoplakia, mixed to red and white, nodular, outgrowths, rounded, so verrucous. So this proliferative verrucous leukoplakia, multifocal, resistance to treatment, high risk of malignant transformation because it's often thought that this is likely to be a malignancy at first presentation. You know, it's, it may not be a pre-malignant condition, it is a malignant condition. And the clinical subtypes have a bearing on outcomes. So the risk of malignant transformation varies and the homogenous, as I said, low risk of malignant transformation, non-homogenous, high risk of transformation. And again, from, uh, from Isaac van der Waal, um, you know, this uh, little uh, flow diagram uh, of, uh, you know, how to treat uh, uh, leukoplakias, eliminating the cause, no possible cause, all have a biopsy, as if the lesions persist, all need a biopsy. And I'm happy to, uh, to leave it at that, uh, uh, at this stage. And um, I uh, thank you uh, very much uh, for, uh, for your attention. I, I hope I've tried to keep within the, uh, the time frame. I apologize for going over overall. So a very broad topic and a, um, a quick walk through uh, pre-malignant conditions. Thank you, Dr. Sambrook, for that, uh, uh, that presentation of yours, a very difficult topic to deal with indeed. Uh, and uh, you know, the, the, as I think in Australia, it would be the same as in India. Uh, when you see a pre-malignant lesion, you do not know whether you should observe the lesion or you should intervene. Uh, so that is the question, I think. There's only one question that has come up in the question uh, uh, box, which uh, uh, asks after listening to your whole lecture, the question that arose is, how do you manage pre-malignant lesions or how do you manage potentially malignant disorders? You know, in, in effect, do you observe or do you give them chemoprotective agents or do you do a biopsy? What is your answer to that, Professor Sambrook? I, I always do a biopsy. 
Um, I don't think uh, we can avoid uh, doing a biopsy. And then again, some of these lesions are quite extensive. So, you know, if you can convince yourself that, um, you know, we haven't got malignancy uh, uh, present, but it's an extensive lesion, then uh, close observation with continued biopsying, um, you know, when the, when the lesion appears to change. For smaller lesions, I would remove the lesions with a conservative margin, um, you know, uh, uh, but oftentimes people with pre conditions, you've actually got field changes uh, across the whole of the, the buccal mucosa or the surface of the tongue. And yes, you can, you can remove large surfaces of mucosa, but wherever you stop, oftentimes there's, a, there's an area that, that you need to, uh, to find. So biopsy, okay. ensuring there's not malignancy and then close, close observation. And okay. sometimes I would see these people three monthly but yes. certainly, you know, six monthly, but, uh, you know, if you've got a smaller uh, homogenous white patch, you know, um, again, cut it out, it's less of an issue, but it's okay. really those wide areas, non-homogenous, non, non uh, you know, a little bit verrucous at times, uh, smoker, exactly. you know, you've but, really got to be concerned yes. that at some stage, they're yes, going to a, a real uh, significant um, uh, neoplastic process. Fantastic. Yes, Professor Sambrook, the, the, the challenge here is that the, the lesion look very innocuous, unlike the previous speakers who spoke about bleeding, which looks very dramatic, and the patient yeah. needs treatment, but a potentially malignant disorder looks very innocuous. And uh, many a times the challenge is that the patient does not come back for an, uh, you know, a follow up uh, because it does not worry him. So I think patient counseling is also a major part, plays a, plays a major part. And uh, as you said, as you said, the area, the, the uh, more than, you know, the larger areas, uh, heterogeneous appearance, erythroplastic uh, uh, appearance, I think these are all um, uh, highlights on uh, the higher risk of this lesion turning malignant. Isn't that right, Dr. Sambrook? That's correct. And uh, there's yes. another question and there about uh, antioxidant tablets and various creams yes. and things like that. We've yes. gone through these phases of rubbing all sorts of things onto them, taking tablets, and really yeah. uh, we haven't come up with a, a good solution because this is a heterogeneous group of conditions. It's not just a, a single condition and, and really, as we've said, education, close follow-up, biopsy, and uh, is really the mainstay of treatment of these. Yes, sir. And what do you think about field cancerization, sir? Uh, that's another challenge, right? It's, it's very much Field a challenge. cancerization. Again, yes. uh, they might pack, pick up a small uh, T1 uh, and you treat that uh, and you might treat it aggressively, but it doesn't matter how aggressively you treat it, it's still the margins may have dysplasia or there's field changes. Exactly. You may or may not do a neck or you do it, you know, conservative uh, cancer procedure yes. for a T1 and yeah. then another one will come up a few years later, a few years later, another one comes up and then oftentimes I found anyway, you seem to get a massive one that that will pop up. Got the point, Professor Sambrook. This, this challenge is global, we understand. Uh, and yeah. if we have to discuss, we can keep on discussing. So I think we should uh, move on to the next panelist. Thank you very much, Professor Sambrook. So over to... Professor Vijay Kumar, who's all set to talk to us on an overview of the management of oral cancer. Professor Vijay Kumar, over to you, sir. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. It's actually a great pleasure to be in midst of all of you. And uh, this talk I have prepared for the, a very average young student as I was, and not for a learned audience. So they should uh, pardon me for going from the scratch. Number one, you would be wondering why I chose this topic to be spoken to you people. Number one, you all know, most of the youngsters may or may not know that we are the one of the largest producers of oral cancer in the world. We contribute to more than one third of the global burden of oral cancers, that is Indian subcontinent. And even today, we see the highest incidence of oral cancer globally, that's in India. So you also know why of it, although Professor Paul very eloquently spoke about the etiology, 
one important thing from our point of view all all who are working here know it that is the smokeless tobacco and the chewing of tobacco we taught the world how to use tobacco without smoking so that is the main main reason although hpv is coming up but the usage of tobacco has been considered as one single reason for oral cancer the second reason is when i was heading the department of oral oncology in hidwai cancer institute for those of you uh, who may not know what it is it's a, it was a regional cancer center and now upgraded to the state cancer institute in bangalore we used to see 1000 to 200 oral cancers per annum biopsy proved 1200 oral cancers and most of them come in such an advanced stage i used to feel every day miserable and i have to do something for that i thought and i have done quite a few of things which is not a part of the discussion today starting from one side uh, the early detection activities to uh, the clinical trials on the locally advanced disease today i want to sensitize an average dental student and a dentist that how he has to approach an ulcer which he may think it is innocuous and that was the basic reason i accepted it but at the same time just talking about very very basic level may not be useful so i am going to give an overview of of the uh, cancer management oral cancer management and it is most of the time what we are talking is the way in india most of us do it and i am very sure all the senior colleagues of mine from india will accept what i am going to talk because it's basically this i i suppose my uh, slides are able we are able to see i don't know because i just shared the slide i hope you are able to see the slides hoping that i will quickly thank all the organizers for inviting me to be a part of this management for this program and also mainly dr dipsan who wrote to me to be a part of it thank you very much for doing so i spent about 35 years in cancer and i came out of uh, the regional cancer center to set up a cancer institute in uh, and yenapaya deemed to be university with the support of tata trust and we are establishing a comprehensive cancer setup that is my background for which i am talking the most important one which i would like to stress on the slide for an young student would be don't look at the tumor alone look at the patient as a whole is the age the performance status in the organ system are going to dictate although you may have everything under your sight you may have surgery you may have radiotherapy etc but you may have to have no there is a patient who are whom you are treating and not the disease per se coming to the treatment very eloquently professor paul has covered the etio etio pathogenesis etc and the pre malignant and the lesions and the pre malignant conditions which is recently defined redefined as the potential malignant disorders so i will just take away from him from where he left it's easy now for me to go in a continuum where the the treatment actually starts with pre prevention primary prevention is what i was trying to stress on saying that tobacco don't use tobacco don't get, you don't get cancer if you can do that it is primary prevention prevent the exposure itself secondary prevention is it has happened but you are going to detect it early and that is secondary prevention again it is very effectively can be done oral oral cavity being a very easy organ and superficial organ to just to open the mouth to see so today we are going to concentrate on the tertiary prevention that is nothing but the treatment of an established disease for the benefit of the students as uh, uh, eloquently asked by professor rina that is when it comes yearly that is the time it's a challenge it may come as a very small different texture different color changes many times is the asymptomatic in a very early stage that's how it comes but unfortunately in india most of the cancers come very late according to the icmr data of 2016 published in 2017 all cancers it's not oral cancer all cancer treated in india only 12% of them or less than 12% of them come in early stage that is the that is the most painful thing to know about it because all our efforts money time spent on them will go waste unless they come early such a potentially curable disease is cancer of the oral cavity but we reach we we they reach us a little late and if they are late we are going to have a problem they are going to have a problem 
most of the time what we present they present to us is well known to all of us here from our country there is a large mass or an ulcerative lesion loss of function trismus etc from the benefit of the students the primary lesion is going to be either an exophytic that is proliferative lesion or an endophytic or an induration lesion most of the time it is combination of both so it will be ulcero proliferative or ulcero infiltrative that is endophytic lesion is more more in duration is endophytic the more proliferative part is called as exophytic but the most of the time it is a combination of both most important one i would stress here would be a bi digital examination a clinical examination is one i will keep on stressing and again and again because imaging comes much later whereas the clinical examination is the most important one which can easily diagnose visually that is by inspection and by palpation you can make out whether it's locally advanced etc then comes the regional nodes regional nodes of the neck again one sided neck is called as regional nodes for that but many of them present with nodes many times they are positive in our country and so that is examination of the node is also important as we move on we'll see in the clinical examination of the primary primary tumor the staging is mainly by clinical examination by the bi digital examination till it touches the bone the moment the bone is involved or the bone is the tumor is very close to the bone then comes the uh, the help of our uh, uh, imaging and the imaging conventionally we used to do olden days skyogram no more it is done because the sensitivity is poor it has to have at least 30 to 40% destruction to be picked up by the conventional skyograms and so we don't do but orthopentamogram is done routinely even today that is mainly to know the minimal involvement also the the depth of destruction can also be made out whether the canal is involved or not can be nicely made out and also for comparing with the ultralateral side for us to decide about the uh, replacement when if it is required but more often done is a ct scan for the bone for the bone the most important one is the high resolution ct scan which can pick up nicely there is always a, a, a controversy or a confusion for the a student point of view whether they will ask for a ct scan or mri when it comes to the oral cavity so the thumb rule conventionally is simple that for a bone it is ct scan for soft tissue it is mri and for example bone marrow involvement can be picked up better by mri than ct scan but we can't be doing all the tests and all the scans in everywhere but for our knowledge mri is very important in the tongue because when the deep infiltration can be picked up by mri over and above the ct scan in all other places ct scan is good enough and it has been already touched upon by him coming to the nodal disease staging clinical staging is the most important as i said it is palpable non palpable once it is palpable whether it is mobile or fixed i'll come to that earlier it was not given importance to in the staging system currently it is given then comes the size size is even today it is given importance to whether it is less than 3 cm or more than 3 and in, uh, between 3 and 6 and more than 6 even today it is given and it increases the staging by n1 n2 n3 as we go on we'll see but the more important problem is how to prove them when they are clinically non palpable a clinically non palpable disease is what is more an important uh, problem for us because whether we have to go and do or not i did a small study when long long back maybe 25 years ago or did i just to know what is happening n0 non palpable disease we, uh, i i just did a neck disease comprehensive neck dissection i'm talking 30 years ago and then we saw what happened to them you won't believe me at, at least 50% of the time irrespective of what is the primary status of the t etc and the subside it was positive making me feel that n0 clinically is useless but at the same time you look at the other side 50% of the times it's an unnecessary surgery so then we thought why not we take the advantage of the other imaging when you try to do that the ct scan as i said resolution rate or the accuracy rate is around 60 to 70% and the mri rate is around 70 to 80% and only the to my own surprise the high high frequency doppler high frequency ultrasound had the best result but the problem with high frequency that uh, ultrasound is 
availability of the high frequency probe and secondly more importantly the time and expertise and the patience required out of the observer because it is observer dependent that is the main thing and the most important thing came out was uh, depth of invasion as a pathological marker when it is more than 4 mm uh, depth they felt that the nodal disease uh, even in n0 turned out to be positive was high and what did we do for that this is uh, our own study which i did in kidwai and published the data it is in 2011 wherein uh, we actually took oral tongue anterior to third tongue as i said the number was huge in that place where i worked and in fact in the five years it was somewhere around 1400 cases uh, see a tongue biopsy proved but for this study what i have taken is only n0 that is non palpable neck nodes so in that study what i did was i i did a, i addressed the primary only for the sake of the study and then send it to the pathologist asking for the uh, depth of invasion and when the depth of invasion were more than 4 mm i addressed them with surgery neck dissection and to my surprise most of the time they were positive it's a published data you are welcome to see it's around 70% of the times they are positive and only in 30% of the times we felt that they were not positive but our problem would be whether to go with 70% or 30% was the issue which was of course well addressed by my colleague from tata memorial which i will be talking later the oral cancer staging this i want to stress for the student sake because till 2017 it was easy to remember less than 2 cm is t1 2 to 4 is t2 more than 4 is t3 adjacent structure involvement was t4 it's so simple but the depth of involvement was now infiltration was now added where of course i am happy that uh, my own paper has, was talking about in 2011 but the problem here is how to assess this pre operatively making a case that this cannot be used according to me in a pre operative setting to make out a depth of invasion other uh, senior colleagues who are sitting there may throw some light on it post operatively in a ptnm yes depth of invasion is possible with a micrometer with a pathology microscopy but pre operatively i don't know how to make it clinically particularly when it is subtle it's easy very thick it is easy whereas in between saying that it is whether it is 5 mm only or less than 5 or more than 5 it is difficult coming to the nodal status it was also easy uh, single less than 3 cm more than 3 and less than 6 was n2 and more than 6 is was n3 and ipsilateral contralateral bilateral multiple were taken into account till 2017 one extra thing added which is according to me is also very good that is the extra nodal extension the pericapsular spread was not given respect to till that time now if there is a pericapsular spread so called extra nodal extension it automatically becomes n3 that's an important change which has occurred in the tnm staging currently and uh, of course the staging system is a combination of everything in our own uh, colleague from dr subramaniam and subramaniam ayer from uh, uh, from amrita institute in indian journal indian journal of cancer has compared that critically and seen whether the 7th and 8th edition how far the 8th edition things can be implemented in a indian context it's a worth going through an article coming back to the management part the most of the time the confirmation is done by biopsy all of you know so i am not going to insist on this slide much more but remember an incision biopsy on the periphery is much more productive than taking a slough in the center of the biopsy this was again told but for the benefit of the students squamous cell carcinoma is the so commonest cancer and so when we say oral cancer by default we are talking about oral squamous cell carcinoma unless specified otherwise it is squamous cell carcinoma it's so so common on the other side rare melanoma is very rare i had a series of 12 cases published and any type of minor salivary gland tumors can also be there and sarcomas even rarely lymphomas can present coming to oral sub, uh, squamous cell carcinoma as only management if you take basically there are, it revolves around only two modalities one is surgery another is radiotherapy both are complementary to each other if you ask me and you will look at this slide i want the particularly the surgical group who are attending today have to see this i have been training uh, oral can oral orofacial surgeons 
for the last 20 years or so now. Whoever comes to me in oral cancer or ENT stream or general surgery team, I train them. For the simple reason, the oncological principles have to be taught at very early so that they should not think radiotherapy is competitive to a surgery, but it is complementary. Yes, it is in a sim simple T1 disease. Both are curative and either of the two can be used. But most of the time in our country, it is T3, T4. So both have to be used together, one after the other. We'll go on, I'll tell you. To take surgery, it's a very uh, fancy thing for many of us to do. But unfortunately, big, bigger surgeries have now taken care of. And we are now landing up in more and more less surgeries, less radical surgeries. But at the same time, oncological principles have to be maintained. This is possible for two reasons. One, they are coming early, probably. We will be able to do that. Two, we are able to down, downstay them and offer treat, treat, surgical treatment, so we are able to do. Third, most important thing is we have understood the biology by doing bigger and bigger surgeries uh, without realizing how much cut margins you have to give. It's only a waste. One centimeter margin, if you can give, that is more than sufficient and as long as you get the cut margin negative. So when you try to do an un uh, unstretched margin, it's difficult. So you'll be stretching and operating. So I always tell my boys that they must give at least 1.5 centimeter to get the negative margin pathologically positive. The only aim of surgery in cancer everywhere, including oral cancer, is to get a negative margin. Beyond that, we cannot do, we cannot change the biology of the disease with surgery. So what is the aim of treatment as a cancer as a whole, particularly in oral cancer, when you are dealing with a, an organ which has got a functional problem and cosmosis, is they will ask. The most important and probably the only reason for which the patient has come to us and you are treating is oncological control. What is the second aim? Oncological control. What is the third aim? Oncological control. If the oncological control can be, can be achieved, then you think of the functional part and the lastly only you have to think of cosmos. This is in a puristic tense I am talking. Whereas when a patient approaches us, the person will he is going to ask for everything. The patient is going to ask, yes, it is cancer, you have to treat effectively, no doubt. But at the same time, you have to take care of the function that is speech and swallowing effectively. And more importantly, it is in the exposed part of the body face. And hence the cosmos is also comes into the picture. That becomes a challenge. But still, I would say oncological control first, functional control next, third only is cosmosis. And for those people who will be fancied with some things happening here, there are, there, are, there are people who have started talking about the access, access, etc. But the, we are now, cut it off. See, ultimately, our aim in surgery is to get a cut margin negative. Whether you achieve it with a cold knife, with a cautery knife, or a laser, does not matter. But I think it is working. So I'm, I'm not going to show this whole thing. It is only to just create some interest. So this is actually a laser uh, uh, contact, non-contact laser, carbon dioxide laser. We are using it to uh, do a hemiglossectomy. The point is not that, just to uh, make people understand that what we use is, does not matter, but what we achieve is what it matters. That is, you have to get a margin negative so that the, patholo the, the pathologist should be able to tell that it is clearly Yeah. Coming to the mandible, this is another one which I will try to concentrate. Mandible was routinely removed as, even though it was a bystander about 50-60 years ago. Today, no. We remove what is involved and how much is involved. Minimum requirement, what is to be removed is only removed. What is the minimum requirement is again one centimeter normal bone on CT scan clinically and by scan wise 
and it should be normal. The marrow again should be normal. If you can give this much, uh, you, one centimeter clearance is more than sufficient. So we have moved from the days of uh, hemimandibulectomy to segmental to marginal. But marginal was introduced mainly in the beginning for diseases which are falling, uh, mandible falling within the one centimeter clearance of the disease. Whereas now, even for minimal involvement without major erosions, we are contemplating marginal mandibulectomy where organ preservation and function preservation becoming a uh, more important assay and is supported and backed up by post-op RT, which we'll talk. Most of the time, because of the cosmosis, transorally, we are going to approach all these cancers if that is possible. Otherwise, we have to go to the cheek flap. Very rarely nowadays, we do other things for an oral cavity. Mandibulotomy, et cetera, are done only uh, for uh, posterior lesions and uh, oropharyngeal lesions not for the classical oral lesions. Coming to the neck, the classical neck dissection today, what we call, was called as radical neck dissection by John Kreil when he introduced 1906. And he, even today, it is considered as a gold standard by many as a therapeutic procedure. What do you mean by therapeutic procedure? It's a large crude node. We are going to do the, do the dissection to remove the disease. So it is called a therapeutic. What do we do? We remove level one, two, three, four, and five. Once we remove all these group of lymph nodes along with non-lymphatic structures like accessory now, internal jugular vein, and sternocleidomastoid, that becomes a classical neck dissection. Whereas today, we try to preserve certain non-visceral structures, and that becomes the modified neck dissection. What is SOMD or supraumoid neck dissection? It is a staging procedure done today for and for N0 for level one, two, and three are removed for oral cancer. And then I'll just uh, uh, diagrammatically or uh, operative surgery wise, I'll try to show what it is. It is, uh, yeah. See the, you know. Yeah, I'm having some problem with the sharing, but I'm doing it. So this is, again, I'm not trying to show the whole surgery. I am trying to show what it looks like at the end of the procedure. We are trying to remove the whole disease and then you will see what it is to understand. Yes, this is what I'm trying to stress on that see the neck after removing, completely denuded of the fibro fatty tissue, lymph bearing tissue along with lymph nodes is removed. Level one, two, three, four, and five are cleared. We are only denuded muscle, nerve, and vessel is maintained. And as you see there, we have only got the carotid, internal jugular vein having been removed, accessory now being removed. This is the classical neck dissection. And, and next we'll see the difference to make you understand. You can see the difference. I am just trying to show the modified neck dissection just to show the field how it is different and what we have to do for that. The modified neck dissection or type 1, 2, 3, the type 1 is where accessory nerve alone is maintained and type 2 is where accessory now and internal jugular vein are maintained and preserved and the type 3 we retain all the three and again i am not trying completely showing that but this is just to show what we are trying to see see this is the accessory now there you are you are seeing the accessory nerve here you can see that and the internal jugular vein is seen here and more importantly at the end of it you can see the difference now between the classical and what we are now trying to show, that is the, see once the disease is removed, uh, this is what I was trying to show. This is the uh, MND type two, where the whole of the internal jugular vein and accessory nerve is, main, is maintained. What I am trying to stress is, we need not do a classical neck dissection. At the same time, the clearance should be adequate. We have to give a proper clearance and then 
then only we can do, uh, claim that what we have done is the therapeutic neutralization. The, on the other hand, the supramyoid nectar section, which is which I already classified as staging nectar section, is done for N0 basically. And we are doing it for N0 oral cavity, particularly buccal mucosa. There is no confusion where level 1, 2, 3 you are taken away. And again, I am not trying to completely show the pictures or, or the. I am only trying to show what we have removed and it's level one, two, three clearance, all right? So it is level one, two, three clearance. You can see the accessory now coming into the, from top down, you are seeing the uh, digastric being shown and the sternomastoid is being retracted. Actually, what I'm showing is called a submuscular uses of Boca. You are seeing the internal jugular vein. And once this, this clearance of level one, two, three is done, then we are trying to call it as supra neck dissection. Three, three neck dissections are one which every student should remember. One is classical neck dissection and the modified ones, that is MND type 1, 2, 3. And the other one is the supra neck dissection. And this is what we are uh, going to stress on when it comes to management. In simple thumb rule would be N plus means I'm talking clinically and radiologically plus uh, positive notes if you are sure by say FNAC then what we are going to offer is a therapeutic lymph node dissection. Level 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 are removed. Whereas on N0, we are going to do a staging neck dissection. Coming to the reconstruction, which today I will not be able to cover the whole thing, so I am only going to give an overview of what reconstruction, soft part and bone, I am going to tell. Soft part starting from direct closure to pre-tissue transfer. Today in our uh, uh, setting, pre-tissue transfer, if you are doing it, is the Chinese forearm flap is the become standard. As far as uh, then the bulk is concerned, we do we give a, we use a pectoralis major myocutaneous flap more often for the sake of the bulk. Whereas for the bone, we can use a bone anything, but we are now if a bone is used, we always are using fibular graft, microvascular free graft as a replacement. Today has become the so-called standard, uh, though there are so many other things we can use. And when it comes to bone defect, one question will come whether we have to reconstruct every case every time. Answer is no. A central segment, it is mandatory. For lateral segment and uh, ascending ramus, it is optional. But most of the patients today, they are asking for function and cosmosis. And that makes a case for even lateral and ascending ramus. We do uh, the reconstruction routinely. Coming to the treatment by stage, this is what is a conventionally spoken of. T1 means what? Either surgery or RT. And T3, T4 is surgery plus RT. Coming to the N0, as I said, wait and watch was considered to be one of the options, which I'm going to negate later. And the SOND is done as a routine to know whether it is positive or negative. And when you move on to this, what is the risk, risk group? Which group you will observe? Which group you will operate, you may ask. So the group which you are talking about high risk group will be by stage site would be the uh, floor of the mouth, oral tongue and retromolar trigone become high risk areas where more than T3, T4 becomes high risk is more and hence we are going to do. And if the depth of invasion is known again, it is high risk, more than four millimeters becomes high risk. Whereas this issue was settled recently by my colleague friend from uh, Tata Memorial Hospital, Anil D. Cruz, who said, whose paper, is a very well done where 700 plus uh, patients were uh, randomly divided into two arms where the elective neck decision at the time of primary surgery was conferred for other people they were observed for a clinically negative node that is n0 which i said in my my study also in 2011 and in this they have proved that there is a definite role for elective neck decision even for n0 that probably settles the issue today in India, at least, whether you will address the neck or not. If somebody asks, we can boldly tell, yes, you do a neck dissection. Uh, you'll have to do for an N0. The prosthodontics and speech and swallowing rehabilitation is important. I need not tell you people who know much more than me. This is one more thing. We have got the NCG guidelines, etc. Uh, NCCN guidelines, whereas we back in India in 2017, 
the ncg guidelines have come out a few may know many may not know Na ncg is national cancer grid supported by the tata memorial hospital and uh, sponsored by the department of atomic energy it is peer headed by tata memorial hospital under which almost 180 centers are there and we we came with the con this consensus and we have come out for these guidelines for many cancers in you know, i am only talking today oral cancer 2017 this makes a bible for us in india because it is workable practical and feasible at the same time not moving away from science and this is what i would like to attract uh, your attention of the youngsters that there is an ncg guidelines which is there on the website of ncg before i complete we have talked so much on surgery as i said in the beginning radiotherapy is equally important so when do we prefer uh, radiotherapy primarily as against surgery obviously as i was stressing on if cosmosis was worried function in all these cases you will be thinking of radiotherapy over surgery when both are options are available and also you must look at uh, a local facility what is what is available not available and for exopatic lesions and poorly differentiated we would prefer rt over surgery coming to the primary site you see the lip it is easy for us to do surgery no doubt but unfortunately reconstruction and cosmosis and function is a problem and hence radiotherapy is preferable it is interstitial brachytherapy is given for floor mouth it is intraoperative cone beam radiotherapy is given and tongue external beam radiotherapy versus brachytherapy and buccal mucosa you can do both when will you do post operative radiotherapy somebody may ask after the surgery is done as i said t3 t4 disease most of us we give the positive margin surgical margin definitely it makes a case but it's a poor uh, indicator of surgery but the only way to salvage would be surgery, uh, radiotherapy if you cannot go back and revise many times it is not possible and if there is a frozen section positivity although you would have revised we give still give radiotherapy perineural invasion node positivity lymphovascular all becomes an indication coming to the nodes multiple nodes perinodal spread becomes an indication one word of caution is in perinodal spread when it has happened and cut margin positive we not only give radiotherapy we give chemo radiotherapy that is combining chemotherapy with radiotherapy is what we do and this is what is routinely followed all over this i want to keep for one minute for the benefit of my young students you can click it this has been brought out as a, a book for you people and you can use this and download it it is free for you because i made it as a pocket book because i want oral cancer to be a pocket book now in india not as a reference book and particularly for dentists keeping their dentist and oral surgeon in my mind this book was written and in fact it is a karnataka state oral orofacial surgeon chairperson dr sripathi rao has given the forward for this book and it has covered a to z of everything spoken today starting from epidemiology to palliative care i would re request the students to take advantage of that before i conclude i thank you once again for the patient listening and god giving me an opportunity to be a part of this program thank you thank you professor dr vijay kumar for that exhaustive and yet so clear and crisp that you have put forward to us on the overview of the management of oral cancer absolutely enjoyed it sir i'm sure it was helpful for all the youngsters who have listened to you uh, and thank you sir for training uh, young uh, maxillofacial surgeons in your, under you uh, so there are a few questions sir just one or two questions can i ask you sir though we please. have we have overshot overshot please, the time please, please. Uh, sir uh, is there uh, is there any uh, difference in staging of uh, squamous cell carcinoma or buccal mucosa uh, according to the indian medical council i i am not aware of it uh you are talking about staging yes sir stage there's staging, a question no. on that staging we all no. follow only yes, one staging that yes, is sir. staging as yes, uh, i am on in what you call it uh, updated and revised the latest yes, revision is in 2017 which came into uh, vogue from almost 2019 onwards it is called as 2017 guidelines but yes, all started uh, using it from 2019 onwards and i also pointed out some of the uh problems of using it but that apart that is uh, that uh, that uh, the science controversy will continue we may write to them etc but what we follow is tnm of hsc 2017 guidelines only yes sir
Thank you, sir. Sir, and uh, there was a question on the uh, metastasis from the tongue, sir. I think uh, the, the person who asked the question wanted to know uh, which levels of the neck we would uh, uh, manage uh, in a T1 lesion of the tongue, T2 lesion. When will you go for a contralateral uh, dissection? Uh, that, I think that is what they had in mind when they asked that question. Number one, I thought I made it simple. <laughs> yeah. Making thumb rule is very easy, I told. N0, do a staging neck dissection. Staging neck dissection is uh, level 1, 2, 3. This is what oral cancer as a whole we do. For tongue, they give us some exceptions by saying that you have to do an extended SOND that is covering 1, 2, 3, and 4. That is all. Beyond that, there is nothing that we are going to add. But the main problem would be not whether level 1, 2, 3 on ipsilateral. What do you do for the contralateral? Contralateral, when it is N0, we don't touch it at all. Only one reason we will do it is in the tip of the tongue or the tongue primary when it is crossing the midline. Then we are worried that the contralateral may also be involved. And so most of the time this happens with the N plus node on the ipsilateral and N0 node on the contralateral. Exactly. Then the cost comes. And most of the time we will address that by an SOND as though that is a part of the primary if there is a bulky node sitting here and yeah. more often uh, whether it is prude or unprude we follow a thumb rule if the submental nodes are enlarged and positive then the chances of the contralateral having it is very high and so then also we will try to do a staging neck node dissection on the contralateral side otherwise we concentrate on the ipsilateral and ipsilateral only hoping Thank you, there are no disease, number one. Number two, even if it is so, most of the time, post-op radiotherapy, which is given, always they cover the contralateral side also. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, I think the, that was asked by Anum Rana, and um, uh, he's, he, he or she has uh, uh, re-asked that question in the sense he wants to know whether it metastasizes to the thyroid or not. That is what answer uh, is clarified. No. No, it does not metastasize. No. Yes, sir. Yes, thyroid sir. is a different organ, different fascia, different level. Thyroid metastasis doesn't happen or we don't call, accept it as a common occurrence. We don't address okay. it. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. There is one more question. Uh, I know we have overshot, but we still have more than 400 participants still stuck to this place. I'm sure they want to listen to you. Uh, so I am taking the liberty of asking you one more question, sir. Your opinion on sentinel lymph node biopsy has been asked by Sarvan and Gopalan. Your opinion on sentinel lymph node biopsy? I have two answers for that. The sentinel node is upcoming here, no doubt. Most of the time, it is being uh, propagated by, I would say, West. The reason is very simple. For us, as I said, I told my data, as well as the ICMR data, less than 10% of the cases only we are looking at N0. So we are going to do it only in the 10% of the cases only, whether to do sentinel node or not comes. In all other cancers, it is positive node. We have to do therapeutic neck disease. It is number one. And in the 10% of the node dissections, when will we do, when you ask, I already explained the low risk business, but sentinel node is an upcoming thing. Many, many, quite a few people start doing it. Why people like me don't want to do it is very simple. He asks against in other places where it is propagated. For example, in breast cancer, sentinel node is a done thing. In the inguinal region, it is a done thing. For simple reason, if you try to do unnecessarily a dissection, the lymphedema is the answer. And it's a severe lymphedema sometimes occurs in the lower limb. And so they try to avoid if that is possible. Whereas in the neck, I don't see any lymphedema occurring. And even uh, and in my earlier days, I used to do bilateral neck dissection, stage, unstage, etc. They are more therapeutic and the, the, the edema occurring after the SOND particularly, the limited neck dissections is rather unknown to. So trying to do something yeah, unnecessary is one point. Second most important point is technical. When you try to do a primary disease, many times when they are bulky, the disease plus the node looks the same as far as the activity is concerned. That is going to confuse the issue. And the third most important thing is what are we really trying to achieve by avoiding an SOND which can be done in half an hour is very limited for me to say a sentinel node as a role. But as a study, many of us are doing it Many of us may come out tomorrow also how it is useful. But as of today, it is, a, it is only limited to protocol study, but it is not the standard. Thank you, sir. That was very clear, sir.
One last question, sir. Can we use the MRI for measuring the depth of innervation, especially for the tongue? Again, I asked that question subliminal. to you all because I have done my own study on that. I have done an endos, uh, sorry, ultrasound, high frequency ultrasound for tongue, and that is my study, of course, comparing with uh, MRI with clinical. That is clinical thickness, MRI, ultrasound, high frequency. So MRI is considered to be superior, no doubt. And ultrasound, if you ask me, in our hands, it will be better, but I won't accept it because, as I said, it's an observer dependent. And so the time consuming, many of the ultrasoundologists may not have that much time and that uh, sound 0.5 MHz may not be available in the routine ultrasound room. What they have is only 3.5 to 5. So this is another issue. So MRI become, becomes the, the standard now for measuring the, uh, the depth of innovation short of anything else. But the problem here is depth of innovation, I'm taking off a minute extra, is defined today is not equal to tumor thickness. Tumor thickness is thickness from the uppermost part of the lesion disease to the lowermost point of involvement, infiltration. That is tumor thickness. Whereas depth of innovation by definition is from the basement membrane to the lowermost part. So according to me, MRI or clinical, anybody cannot make out depth of invasion if you go by that definition. So it is pathology and pathologists only can say that. If you are going to use it loosely equivalent to tumor thickness, then it is possible with MRI. Uh, Sir, so there's a question from Sanjay. Sir, nice to see I you, sir. A... Dr. Virabahu, nice to see you after a long Thanks. time. After a long oh, yes. time. Eagerly you listening so to you, sir. <laughs> from <Yeah. Brandram. laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for that uh, presentation and answering our questions. It was wonderful, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you very Thank much you. once again for everybody for giving me this opportunity. Well, and so for that. the 400 plus <laughs> stay on a Sunday till 5 o'clock. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Jemson. Thank you. And uh, I'd like to thank uh, all these speakers, uh, Professor Andy Edwards, uh, Professor Paul Sandbrook, uh, Professor Vijay Kumar, and uh, uh, Professor Virabal for spending your valuable time. Yes, I know we have uh, exceeded the time limit, but uh, and, and all the participants who have stayed glued to the presentations for close to three hours. So it was, so that shows the interest that these uh, speakers have generated in their talk and uh, I think, I, think I, I don't have to say anything more than that. <laughs> so thank you all for the fantastic presentations and uh, uh, our editor is here, Dr. Kannan, if you can uh, give him a couple of minutes for him to uh, show the newsletter. Uh, Kannan, are you there? Kannan? Yes, sir. I'm there, sir. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you're driving. Okay. Ah, yes, sir. I just stopped around. <laughs> okay. yes, sir. I'll go for sharing the screen, sir. Yeah, yeah. He has spent quite a lot of time in uh, preparing the... Yes, sir. Is my, is my screen visible, sir? Yes. Ah, uh, yes, sir. So, good evening, everyone, sir. Good evening, everyone. So... Sorry for the initial hitch at the beginning of the program. So I was not audible and I was not able to share it properly due to the technical hitch. And I take pride in sharing the fourth edition of the newsletter of Tamil Nadu and Pondicherry chapter of the AOMSI. Uh, supposed to have been released by October, November due to the COVID pandemic got delayed. And, and following the footsteps of Dr. Arun Kumar under the able guidance of uh, Secretary Dr. Jimson and President Madam Dr. Reena Madam. So I'm releasing. I'd like to mention a special lot of thanks to Dr. Vimalambiga, who has been helping me in helping me in bringing out this newsletter in every aspect, helping me out. Thank you, Dr. Vimala. So I'll just scroll through the newsletters. So this is the cover page, and followed by um, obituary to due uh, to sad demise of the uh, pioneer, Dr. CKD sir, and our. Uh, Obituary messages from the association, followed by the messages from people close to him. And the office bearers as usual. Messages from the president and secretary of the national body. 
and then president secretary and editor of our national body so here dr prabhu has explained how uh, the growth of the uh, tamil nadu pandi chapter in in our state or the of the aomsa in our state how it um, progressed and how it, how they developed it and thanks to dr jimson the series of the webinars here is a list of the webinars and people who have participated the panelists the webinars and the ask your mentor programs and uh, something related to um, an article by dr kannan balaraman who um, discussed about the difficulties that we all came during this pandemic of covid-19 and i'm um, sorry the next slide sorry sorry thing which is the coming slide said included uh, so something new this time so <coughs> some artistic and literary work uh, we have included so these are the cartoons from dr balaji from chennai and here we have included a poem by our very own president madam dr reena madam and few artworks by the staff i mean the post graduates and some faculties and a crossword puzzle here for the post graduates particularly and the upcoming event and in the forthcoming issues we are planning to introduce some interviews from experts interviews from experts and some interesting case discussions case reports maybe are interesting articles so i'd like to thank you once again for give me this opportunity so we'll be sharing this in a group later by dr jamsin thank you sir thank you kanan you have done such a wonderful job congratulations yes. thank you ma'am thank you ma'am thank you sir thank you sir. thank you kanan for the wonderful work and the compilation thank you sir the, thank you sir thank you sir our association has been doing and, uh, yes, thank you thank you uh, professor uh, again Uh, for having spent your valuable time uh, sunday thank you uh, participants i have shared the uh, feedback form in the chat box so kindly fill in the uh, feedback form and you will receive the certificate the next few days and i would like to place on record uh, a deep sense of thanks to striker as always they have been very kind enough uh, in supporting all our uh, programs thank you have a great uh, and a evening thank my you. special thank thanks to professor andy edwards and professor paul samburu who have been yes. kind support to us i think we are going to give you honorary fellowship or membership <laughs> of our <laughs> thank you so much thank, thank you so much especially it's a sunday you have been very kind thank enough to support us thank you, know, you so thank, much thanks very much everybody it's always a pleasure as paul knows as well we are very very grateful to be uh, invited we have very much uh, long memories happy memories of uh, our indian colleagues um and very hopefully good. we'll meet again in um more pleasant times basically yeah yes. thank you absolutely Take, uh, thank you have a nice sunday at the evening thank you thank you. <laughs> thank you thank you have a great bye. day bye bye have bye. a great day bye. thank you bye. thank you bye. thank you jim thank you gpk thank, 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 thank you sir professor vijay kumar sir thank you thank you thank you doctor thank you professor vijay kumar Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you Dr. Veera. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. CPK Dr. Jemson. Thank you. Thank you Dr. Jemson. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, JPK. I'll call you.